Zero Cool Podcast. Welcome out. Happy Sunday, everyone. Big shout to Randon the Padusa. He picked up the fact that we didn't have any audio. So if you were joining us early and you saw my lips moving, but nothing was coming out of it, it's because we were having some audio issues. Uh, Randon still might be a little drunk from uh, being at the game earlier today. So... Uh, he swears he wasn't drinking. <laughs> he was just hitting that electric lettuce in the fucking parking lot. <laughs> anyway, listen, shout out to the Milwaukee Bucks on getting it done today against the Brooklyn Nets. Um, what else did we have going on today? Uh, there's something else I had in my notes. I forgot. Brewers won today, right? Brewers won today, I think, 5-2. Uh, Join us on the podcast, finally. Yeah. <laughs> all the way from Chicago, Illinois. Chicago Nick is in the building. Uh, if you're unfamiliar... Uh, he is the guy who I constantly plug on this podcast as being the the dudes dudes of everything you need to know when it comes to personal <laughs> fitness and dieting. You can check him out at Shadow Personal Training, twenty six eighteen Halstead, Chicago, Illinois. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us today, Chicago Nick. I don't know what to do with my hands. I'm kidding. <laughs> awesome, man. I'm, I'm glad I'm here. This is awesome. Yeah, I'm um, glad you could make it. Uh, you were able to watch the fights last night. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. That great. was. Uh, and uh, I took a page out of like uh, when we ordered the uh, last Poirier McGregor fight. I was of that group that like sat there for thirty minutes refreshing mm-hmm. to try to log in. So I bought it like on Monday. I'm like, I am not missing this fight <laughs> because I guess people couldn't log into the Mayweather Logan Paul thing too. Yeah, because they bought it like an hour before and like the pay per view that overloaded. I don't know. Buying this early, getting it done. Yeah, yeah. That was that was crazy. They had said like people that were trying to buy it as it was coming on air. It just they weren't expecting that much of a flood of people coming in or trying to buy it at once. And it just, it crashed their servers. Uh, there was a lot of weird stuff that happened with that one. Um, number one, the fact that there's a YouTuber that fought one, arguably one of the greatest defensive boxers of all time um, was just absolutely insane. And I know we had talked about this earlier in the week. Uh, there was a lot of people chirping about the fact that uh, Logan Paul had received so much money, and so had uh, Floyd Mayweather in these in this fight. I think it was Francis Nuganu yeah. that tweeted out. Uh, I sent it over to you. I don't even know if I still have it. I think he said something like, uh, "Logan Paul makes twenty mil, and we make something like that." It was some of the some of the effect of he wasn't happy that someone who is not a professional fighter by any stretch of the imagination made a king's ransom of money while he's what well, he made. What I think I think like seven hundred k for the Stipe fight plus. Like, Whatever it was. Yeah. I think I with that, I don't know how his contract's set up. Usually for right. those higher end guys, it's usually like a quarter mil to show and another quarter mil to win. And yeah. when they win, they usually get a better contract. Like they usually like uh I don't know the details of it, but I'll say one of the former welterweight champions I think was getting a half a mil to show and a half a mil to win. Sure. And then he finished out his contract in the exact same way after he was champion. Um I know a lot of guys that have left the UFC. Well, I mean, personally, I, I work with a lot of these guys that have personally left the UFC and gone on to other organizations and gotten extremely lucrative contracts. Uh, Corey Anderson recently tweeted out yeah. that his <clears throat> excuse me, his last fight in the light heavyweight tournament, he had made more money in that one fight than his entire time at the like UFC. Ever, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there, is a, there is a huge discrepancy in that. I will say this. In the UFC's favor, there is a lot that they have. Uh, they have the UFC Performance Institu- Institution. They have one in Vegas, and I believe they have one in China now yeah. as well, where they're developing talent around the world. Also, um, they take care of a lot of fighters. So, for example, we'll say um, there is a fighter that I know really well as well. She might be my girlfriend that... <laughs> That had torn, uh, had a double labrum tear. <laughs> and after her fight on the Contender Series, the UFC picked up the bill for that. Um, so it's one of those that there's a lot that those guys do as far as taking care of them. Sure. There's also stuff that they, they give to the fighters as well. Um, I know another fighter, when his daughter was born, uh, Dana cut him a check for like 40K and was like, hey, put this away for her college fund, whatever. Um, there's a lot that they do behind the scenes, but as far as revenue sharing goes, um, there needs to be something that's out there that helps these fighters make more money. Um, with the fact that these, they have the Platinum and Reebok deal, I think some of that cuts into the uh, sponsorship money that these guys can get. Like when this first changed, I want to say seven or eight years ago, uh, 
Aldo was really upset, and, and reasonably so. He had about um, $100,000 in sponsorships for every time that he fought that he was missing out on. So you go from 100000 to the way that that pyramid was set up between 20 and 40 K that he got. So he was missing out on 60,000, which, you know, for a guy like Aldo isn't really a lot because he was making a ton of money, but at the same time, it's still a lot of money to lose out on 60 K every time you're fighting. Um, where was I going with this? I remember where I was going now. <laughs> I get Francis Nugano's point on the fact that they're not making enough money. And we were looking at the numbers before we, we went on air that, you know, the revenue sharing that they have for the UFC is between 10 to 15 percent, which right. means the other 85 percent is going in Dana and the Fatita's pockets. Or uh, uh, WMA, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. But also, I'll also point out the fact that one of the highest paying guys or highest paid guys in the UFC is Conor McGregor. Right. Um, it's estimated that when he fought Poyer, he he made 25 million um, mm. on top of the fact that he was. I can't I can't confirm this. I remember someone mentioned it. I don't know if the UFC was paid for it, but to get Connor to fight over in Abu Dhabi during the Fight Island series, either the UFC took more money or Connor took more money to do that and make it happen because they want Connor to, to fight over there. And then he fought Poyer. Um he's one of the highest paid guys in the UFC and it's because of the fact that he's a household name like for example I think it was yeah it was my grandma my grandma had brought up to me she's like oh are, are you doing the fights thing this weekend and I was like <laughs> yeah why and this is back when they fought in January she's like oh I heard that Connor's fighting that's my grandma yeah that's how that's how much of a household name he is sure to Nuganu's argument that UFC fighters need to get paid more Yes, I think they should all be paid more. I think none of them make nearly enough money going into a cage, fighting people, uh, risking your livelihood, you know, risking everything, your your long term health, uh, your metabolism from cutting weight. Sure, for sure. These guys should be making as much money as possible. Um, but if you're not a household name, do you really deserve twenty five million when you step in? And what's the proper amount of money that? Someone like Nuganu gets paid. Someone like a Derek Lewis gets paid. Someone, you know, anyone in that top five of any division, what do these guys get paid? I agree that you are what you are marketed. If you're able to, let's say, for example, if you're able to get to a Conor McGregor status and have everyone know your name, you should get paid really well. Otherwise, you can obviously take your talents elsewhere and go do boxing. But where do you go as far as a guy like Francis Nuganu, who's a killer, but not everyone knows his name? You know, taking out Stipe like that, I don't think anyone realizes how hard it is to put that guy down. And Nuganu did it, and did it in a one of the ugliest knockouts I've ever seen in my life. That where you fall back on your own leg. Yeah, yeah. Um, got where to go with that? Yeah, that was a lot. No, that's all good. I mean, <laughs> so. Okay, like I, I did, I told you before, like I, I was looking at this when we talked about revenue sharing briefly. Like baseball after the strike, famous annals because being a White Sox fan, the White Sox had a good shot of winning the title the year before that with the strike. In 96, new collective bargaining gave baseball revenue sharing. Um, in the NBA, they got it in 2012. Uh, the NFL got it, um, actually, I think I found that. Like I think uh, with the last TV deal, uh, 2014, I think Asia was like the bigger one. I could be wrong about some of these numbers, but like the NFL was founded in 1920, the NBA in 1946, and baseball in 1869. So these leagues writ large market their stars city by city. By being a fight promotion, the UFC has taken that and made it a pay per view model. Mm -hmm. As much as I enjoy watching Joanne Calderwood fight last night, or Bilal Muhammad, or um, Damian Maya. No one's going to buy 800,000 million pay-per-views if Damian Maya is the headliner. If, if, the, if, the, if the top car, say, for instance, for argument's sake, Izzy got COVID, um, Figueroa didn't make weight, 
and Nate Diaz got too high and didn't wake up in the morning. I don't mm-hmm. know, whatever. <laughs> and the, the the main fight was Bilal Muhammad against Damian Maya. No disrespect to either of those guys. They can both beat my life into the next universe. But what would that sell? People would be at the gate knocking it down. Yeah. And also for all those other organizations, the NBA have a – not a, necessarily a union. They have like a player association. NFL has a, has a union. Uh, baseball has a union. And I'm not saying the union's the way to go. But as as because the also these fighters to your to your point as well are putting not they're not putting a ball in a net they're not hitting a puck into a net they're not hitting a ball over a fence they're throwing bones at each other and does that merit more money I'd like to say yeah um but at what point in time is like guys like Nick Lentz and Ryan Hall who are names to you and me but your grandmas know who those people are. Yeah. And do they deserve a million dollars a year? I, hell yeah, they do, man. They do something that I, no way I could do that. The issue is that when you have a stable of fighters that's 500 people deep, like the NBA has that many people, that many people, no one's tuning in to watch the defensive tackle for the Kansas City Chiefs. They're coming in to watch Patrick Mahomes. So that Mahomes makes $40 million a year, the tackle makes a mil. Yeah. So the difference there is not, it's different. The tackle's still making a mil. But the guy's on his first contract with the UFC is making a thousand dollars, and then Connor's making twenty. So the difference is still there, league to league. It's just that overall, the majority of the fighters, I think I'm correct on this, are making below what we would call a livable wage per fight, i.e., say fifty k to win, fifty k to show, whatever it is. That, oh, and the win bonus is that's a whole different conversation because you're getting paid if if you lose, you lose your money. That in baseball, if you strike out, you don't, they don't take your check away. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> someone someone broke down the math. There was a YouTube video that was on it, and they had said um, most people's starting UFC contract is ten to show, ten to win. Okay. So you take into account gym fees. Your gym takes probably ten percent. We'll just for argument's yeah, sake, yeah. We'll, we'll do ten percent. Make them round numbers. Uh, you're paying your your manager another ten percent. So that's twenty twenty five percent of your paycheck. That's already gone to 4K gone already to your gym, uh, to your management, and then I think UFC covers your pre medical. So it's like when you gotta get uh, MRI, CT, yeah. get your head CT, uh, get your physical, so on and so forth. I think the UFC reverse reimburses you for that, but on a regional scene, you have to get all that done okay. out of your own pocket. So you're already seeing twenty five to thirty percent of your check going away. Now, on top of that, you still have to win. Now, if you win, you still got to take money out of that extra ten, that extra ten k that you get that you won, hoping that you got maybe a some sort of bonus. We'll just take the bonus out of the equation. So twenty k when you won, Uncle so, Sam, Uncle Sam as well. <laughs> plus, plus you got to pay taxes on that. And the UFC usually guarantees about three fights a year on your contract that's that's their end of the deal otherwise they they're obligated to pay you for not fighting so after all that between paying taxes paying your management paying your gym fees someone did the math and said that the average low rank first contract fighter makes around twenty seven thousand a year there you go and now now this is We'll use this as an example. If you're watching, by the way, if you're watching the fights, uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, <laughs> tune out. I don't want to hear any fucking complaints on YouTube like, oh, man, I was going to watch the fights it was on ESPN. Get bent up until you said so and so one tune out now. Tune in another ESPN time. Plus next week, yeah. We're, we're going to go over a little bit of, of two, UFC 263. Now, if you're a guy like uh, like Hill last night, the <laughs> the the opening card on the main event. Uh, fought Paul Craig. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> oh, exactly. God. The the man, the man had his arm hyperextended, and then he, on on top of that, got put into a triangle and was eating elbows from the bottom from Paul Craig, as his arm is flopping in the wind. I don't know what contract Hill is on. Yeah, but the fact that he had his arm broken, he's gonna be laid up for at least six months. Well, it's a minimum six month medical suspension yeah. plus whatever. Whatever time he they has, they popped off. it back in the back. In the back, they said, 
Well, so like after. Do you af- see that? Do you see that? Yeah. My yeah. skin just fucking crawled hearing that. <laughs> yeah. So he dislocated his ulna. So underneath there. So if you, if you watch the fight, when they're raising the hands, he can't even stand up there. You see a big bulge. Yeah. It was on the inside of his elbow. arm. It was, it was, it was, yeah. It was, it was, so when he had him, when he had him arm barred out, he twisted his arm over the top and it popped. And you and I had the discussion whether or not we, we weren't sure if he tapped. I thought he did. Like he was pointing to something saying, hey, my arm is no longer attached to my elbow. <laughs> well, Paul had looked up at the ref. Uh, by the way, shout out to, uh, to Chris Ninetoes, uh, his fiance Bobby, <laughs> uh, Cassidy, uh, who's been on this podcast twice, or two or three times now at this point. All came and watched the fights with us over at Brothers. Um, we, were, we were talking about this, and it looked like he had tapped as he was rolling with the arm bar. And all of a sudden, Paul literally takes his arm and it's going the opposite direction. And and Paul looks up at the ref and goes, I just broke his arm. Yeah. And yeah. the ref never stopped it. And you know, to to Paul Craig's defense, I will say this. The, the ref didn't pull him off of him. So he kept going, which is the right thing to do. But at the same time, like, yeah, that's a that's a hard place to be when you, you knowingly broke someone's arm it, it, it goes back to when tony ferguson got his arm hyperextended by um olivera that guy's too tough for his own good though yeah you know you look at guys like this who have had injuries like this you know and i can easily make an argument uh, uh chris weidman on the previous pay-per-view who, yeah who shattered his tibia jockery he popped his arm same same pay-per-view yeah yeah he has, he, i think it's not, it's not like a gunshot going off when his arm, arm busted uh, <laughs> you have these injuries that are happening to these to these fighters and yeah, the UFC is taking care of their medical, but you know, there's a possibility that Hill may not fight the same way he used to after this injury. That there isn't anything that's out there to protect these fighters long term. What's the answer to that? I I don't know. There yeah. there's there isn't a group of fighters that are rallying together, and and it's tough because of the fact. You look at the fact that this is an individual sport. It, we all say it's a, a team sport, that we all work together as a team. But at the end of the day, it's an individual sport. Sure, a lot of people sure, look sure. out for themselves. Um, it's weird to see someone like Logan Paul, someone like Jake Paul, <laughs> who are the guys who are kind of out there fucking with Dana and the Fertitas saying, you know, we're nobodies. We're, we're making... You know, Logan Paul, or not Logan Paul, Jake Paul. That's the one that fought Askren, right? Yeah, Jake did, yeah. Jake made like $110 million for knocking Askren. Much? Yeah. Oh, damn. Okay. Well, they had they had over a million pay-per-view buys, but they also might be inflating their numbers. There's a lot True. of There's a lot of BS. But say it was a mil. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, still, it's still a million pay-per-view buys. Yeah. Regardless. So let's say he took a dollar on, you know, $10 on every single one of those, sure. you know? He's still he's still going to the bank. I can ask and got one of his biggest paydays ever. Now he's gonna fight Tyron Woodley, and I was just I heard that and I was like, yeah. The even crazier part about that is the fact that Tyron is the underdog going into this fight. Yeah, I think he's like I want to say he's plus two fifty or something like that. And I was like, that that can't be right, man. Like Tyron, like number one, I've seen Tyron train when he was training for uh, Kamaru Usman. He was over by us training, and a lot of what he did was is boxing and he i mean the dude's crisp and then on top of that he's a wild card training fighter i was gonna say he trains over at wild card too he's been over there for a while i mean the dude's a total package he's a wrestler he's a martial artist he's a rapper (laughs) (laughs) you had a cameo and straight out of compton yeah he did well he he had been an actor beforehand before i think before he had he had ever joined the ufc like he had aspirations for being an actor same with paul felder shout out to him too which yeah, well, by the way, well paul has a degree in theater though yeah by the way probably one of the funniest funniest things ever was paul had joined the gym i want to say three or four years ago and it was it was neat because i every morning when i went in there i'd see him because he was staying at the gym at the time and uh dan gonzalez had had introduced me to him and he had asked he's like you know i'm looking for someone to write my music for he was fighting in scotland i think i remember that yeah um, and he had Dan had introduced me to him because he was like, "Oh, we have a DJ that produces music. You should talk to Parker." So I introduced he I get introduced to him. We're shooting the shit, and he's like, "Yeah, he's, he's giving me the layout of what he wants." He's like, "Yeah, I kind of want this like airy Celtic music," and then he's like, "I want to go into shipping up to Boston." I was able to find the stems for shipping up to Boston. Okay, uh, so like we do this real airy Celtic like music where it's like, that, oh. yeah. 
and then all of a sudden just <laughs> it comes it comes to a slow fade and all of a sudden you hear the ding 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 and I dubbed over the drums and the drums just crash in and I told Paul I was like hey man I was like I listened to this on a pretty good sound system I want to know when you do your fight I was like how does it sound when when it comes in on the speakers because I wanted to know like how hard it hit he goes dude there was such a pop when the, he's like the banjo's playing and everyone's yeah. kind of hearing it and all of a sudden it crashes in he's like and the crowd just erupted and I was like yes that's exactly nice. what I wanted yeah, to hear exactly but um where the hell was, how the hell did I start talking about Paul Felder um Tyron Woodley and then boxing and then Paul Felder oh, theater music, and acting yeah. and uh so the really Tyron, cool yeah. the really <laughs> cool part Compton. the really cool part about the Paul Felder thing was I didn't know Paul that well at the time I didn't know he was into acting and we were at McGillicuddy's. Dan Hicks and I were after hours cleaning. <laughs> we're after hours cleaning with uh, with drinks in our hands. And the TV's on, and it's on like FX, and Always Sunny in Philadelphia comes on. And I was like, oh, is this a new one? Dude, turn the audio on. So we're watching Always Sunny in Philadelphia on the upstairs at like 3.30 in the morning yeah. at McGillicuddy's. And all of a sudden, Paul's in the episode. It was the Crow's Milk episode. I've never seen the episode. I've never seen the, okay. show. I've never seen the show, man. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay. I know. I'll, I'll show you the part afterwards. And it's a hilarious It's a hilarious one, but at the same time, like, Paul's in it, and I'm literally like, I'm, at, I'm looking at Dan Hicks. I was like, I, I just wrote music for that guy. I was like, this is fucking crazy. <laughs> nice. I was like, he's training at our gym right now. I was like, that's crazy. But, um, yeah, all those guys. Like, w- the fact that Paul had to stay at our gym when he came out there, shows that these guys don't make nearly enough. Like now he's to the point where he's got a great broadcasting contract, right. he had a, an amazing contract with the UFC after the fact. But I mean, he, that was a guy who was already a couple of years into his career and he still wasn't making what he, what he should be making. Arguably, you know, one of the toughest 155ers out there, yeah. you know, cut 30 pounds to fight RDA on with six no days notice. No excuses. Well, and called other people out. People had missed weight. Rightfully so, though. Yeah. Rightfully so. Um, you have one job, man. Make weight. That's it. Um, yeah. I mean, shit, dude. The, all those guys should make more money. Like I said, going back to what I was saying before, what's the correct answer? Is it collective bargaining? Is it a fighter's union? There was rumbling about it in the past. Yeah. Uh, GSP, TJ Dillashaw. I remember that. I Cowboy got in there. Cowboy. Bit, yeah. They all kind of got together. And then all of a sudden... Is crazy. GSP got this title opportunity to come out of retirement, fight Bisbing, and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, all that momentum kind of died out after he yeah. came back in. I think what happened was like, well, two things there. Well, number one, GSP was an Under Armour athlete, so Reebok had to pay them off to get him on there because Reebok sponsored the UFC. Mm-hmm. That was that was a, and B. Um, I think one of the big issues with the, with the lack of a union is that. The ownership is also the promotion. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, like if you see like Floyd May- Mayweather fighting Manny Pacquiao for the WBA f- welterweight title from Mayweather Promotions, yeah, and Bob Aaron Promotions, top rank, they're promoting the fight, but the WBA is a, is a governing organization of that. So that's where I won't go down the down that rabbit hole. But that's how Floyd made his money. He was he never had a promoter. He never signed with Don King or Golden Boy or Bob Arum. He was always his own guy, Eddie Hearn. Mm-hmm. He was just Floyd Mayweather by Mayweather Productions. So he he ran the whole show. That was his genius behind his business. So when it came to that, there's a split. So the promotion can argue on behalf of the fighter, etc. But Dana White is the promoter for his company. That's where it gets deeper and deeper and deeper down 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 the pike here is because sure you want to have a union and collect the bargain, I get it, but like your boss is also your promoter. Mm-hmm. So if you piss off the man, maybe you won't get on that car. You'll be on a fight night in, you know, who gives a shit Kansas instead of on UFC two sixty four. So and I remember, I remember there's like a, there's like a small roaming of him and Cowboy being best buddies, and Cowboy being up on the stage with Tim Kennedy and Nate Marquardt and all this other kind of stuff. And it was like, "Were you going against me?" And then he ran away. It's like, Ugh. so. And, and, and even and then you want to back the whole thing up. UFC is what, thirty years old, twenty years old, twenty five, ninety three. Yeah, nine thirty years old. So I think there, and then it's it's became the mainstream. I'd say obviously un, 
inarguably after Tough won. So 15 years ago? Yeah. 16 maybe? I mean, I remember getting the – I remember going into I, – I, <laughs> here's a story for you. In Arlington Heights, where I was, at this point in time, we had moved there from Chicago. I was like 14 at the time. Uh, my dad and I went to Family Video. Mm-hmm. You know, the big set, the big Friday night. You went down to the video store. You pray to God that that video was behind the sh- you know the 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 cover of like Terminator Two. And you got Terminator Two. And, oh my God, we got the VC. We got the got the VHS. I wanted him to get me UFC One and Two on VHS so I could watch it. We couldn't find it anywhere. So we asked the guy at the front counter, hey, do you have the UFC, the UFC uh, VHS? He goes, yeah, yeah, it's in the back room. He goes, what? So my dad had to walk in the porno room with, like, the cowboy <laughs> doors and the beads down there. He's like, he looks at me, he goes, you better fucking like this. So my dad had to walk back <laughs> into the porno room and come out with two fight videos for me. He came home and I was like, oh, God, this is awesome watching Hoyce Gracie and, like, Tank Abbott and uh, all those guys, like, fighting UFC 1 and 2 and Ken Shamrock and all those other guys. It was awesome. So, yeah. Uh, he goes. We go. Goes. Don't tell your goddamn mom what I fucking did in there. So yeah, that was that was the, that was my first induction to UFC. Was my dad going to a porno room? Obviously, I didn't know what it was. I was thirteen. I just uh-huh. I knew it I know it's just an adult section. I just figured it was rated R movies. I had no idea. But yeah, he had to go in there to get the the tapes for me. <laughs> I remember, uh, man, I was like five or six. Uh, we grew up. Well, I when I first uh, we first lived in Greenfield. My mom was going to school. I remember there was like kind of like a family video down the street from where we lived. And I remember like, I remember seeing the swinging cowboy doors yeah, yeah, and yeah. whatnot and, and the beads. But I was so young and so short at the time that like I would just walk and like I would never scrape my head on those swinging doors. <laughs> oh, God. So like I just walked in and was just like, where the hell am I? Like yeah. not paying attention to what's going on. <laughs> and I just remember like an arm coming, grabbing me by the back of the shirt and dragging me yeah. out and being like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know where. <laughs> yeah. Where's the <laughs> He-Man going? video? Yeah. But I totally remember that. And that's crazy, dude. Yeah. Um, That UFC one, I watched it again, like a couple of summers ago. And it was crazy. That first fight was a sumo wrestler versus a kickboxer. And I think the kickboxer knocked out the sumo guy's tooth. Uh, There was a guy who fought, there was a boxer that fought with a glove because he was concerned oh, he about... The, he had the one glove. He had the one glove. And I never understood it. And I heard the story behind it a couple of years I, yeah, later. I'll think of his name in a minute. I don't remember his name. But yeah, he had one glove. I could probably pull it up in a minute. And but, then, uh, yeah, yeah, Ken Shamrock had the wrestling shoes on and his hands taped up. I yeah. remember that. Yeah, it was great. And then he fought uh, he fought Ho- Hoist Gracie in the, in the finals. finals. Yeah. yeah. And that was crazy. You know, going back to that, you look at that and you're like, dude, fucking Hoist came out in a fucking gi. Him in a gi, yeah. He fought in the gi. Just, Couple guys did, but yeah, he was he was the main one. Yeah, came out in the gi, and I was like, yeah, I look back on that now, and I'm like, you put a horse collar <laughs> and everything else yeah. around you to be able to fucking be grabbed and shit like that. And it's crazy because of the fact that like, I don't know if Ken just didn't have the experience with guys who who train gi. He was a sambo guy, right? I I don't know. That's a good question. Sambo or wrestling? One of the two. Probably wrestling. And uh, he never grabs the gi. Never no. Has no idea what to do with it. And I don't think anyone knew to like just grab that gi and be like, oh, if if you're my guard, like I might be able to cross choke you. Anything. I yeah. might be able to do. Any, you know, it's, I might. It's, be a, able to, it's a lever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then years later, you you don't see it. Like I think. Yeah, GSP was the only guy that ever came to the ring with he, it. He or came out, to the octagon. He ran out in, in his karate guy. He because yeah, yeah. he was a he was a Kyokushin guy. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. You do that now and trying to wear a gi in the fucking in the octagon, you just yeah, get fucking grabbed yeah. up and tuned up. Yeah, you know, no, just that's, that's, grab the lapel and just left hand them all day. Let, just let let them go flying. Yeah. But yeah, that was uh to 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 track that back. That was a uh, that was a gnarly little dislocation last night. Oh yeah, but, but the rest of that card was. I mean, it was nothing ex- shocked me except for your boy is now the first ever Mexican-born champion <laughs> in the UFC. Yeah, shout out to Brandon Moreno, uh, the new uh, flyweight champion. Uh, that was crazy. I, you know, here's the thing. Figueroa, uh, we'll, we'll go over the card in a second once again. Spoilers. Tune the fuck out if you don't want to hear it, man. Um, Figueroa, just, I mean, he's gotten off to slow starts in the past. No, I saw him in the corner. And it was just... It wasn't there. He wasn't there. No, I think no. he was tuned out. He was trying to force himself to go through. And you know what? He, the thing is, 
fighters have these nights, man. Yeah. They just they're checked out. They don't want to be there. I guess he had problems making weight too, though. Yeah, and that's he, dude, made, he made it with like four minutes to spare. Yeah, if you got a bad weight cut, that's not you know that's not ever good. No. It, it wears on you. It wears on you mentally. Um, but yeah, Moreno looked good. It, it, it was great because of the fact that I was watching. I got chills watching. You see him crying. He's got the belt. Joe Rogan's trying to talk to him. And he's still got his mouthpiece in. Yeah. And Joe's like, take your mouthpiece <laughs> out, buddy. Let, let's hear from you. And, you know, first Mexican-born champion. First, uh, I think he was on the, the tough version of Mexico, uh, Mexican. or La- Mexico. Latin America. Latin, Latin America. America. Yeah. Um, you know, awesome by him. What else was going on? Leon Edwards Diaz. That was uh that wasn't exactly what that was going to be. Yeah, it, it was a brawl. We had we had a bet going at Brothers. What was the over under of when uh, Diaz would start bleeding? We had two and a half rounds, which was on point. Yeah, yeah, that elbow from the guard from the uh, when he was uh, when Leon was in his guard. Yeah, he got opened up twice, right above his eye. Yeah, and then right on the side of the head. That one on the side of the head was pretty big, but it wasn't leaking all that bad, which I was pretty surprised about. Shout out to the cut man being able to keep that under control for, sure. for the entire fight. Um. He was getting he was getting tuned up pretty well. I think going into the third, he had a nice mouse under his left eye. Yeah, it was on the cut. Yeah, it was well. It was right here, and then he had a cut right above the the yeah, yeah, eyebrow, and right. then he yeah, had yeah. another one on the side yep, of the yep. head. Um, and then we were he's getting his ass kicked for four rounds, and then the last one ninety goes, second one goes through. He uh he was going one two the two goes through and uh and stuns Leon. And he's moving backwards. Uh, and Diaz is just trying to close the show. You know, Diaz getting his ass kicked for 23 minutes and then all of a sudden tries to close the show in the last 90 seconds um, is part of the reason why Diaz is such a draw, man. You know, Diaz is not that dude that went out trying to be marketable. I mean, at one point he was cut from the UFC. I might have to take that back. I might have no, to walk that back. No, I never did. I thought he was no. I think it was Nick that got cut. Nick was smoke. cut. Yeah, yeah for, Nick was uh, cut for yeah. smoking weed, yeah. and then three he, years. Well, he was. This was early on in his career, so he was cut, and then they ended up re-signing him again. Um, he had he had won a fight against somebody, and then his post-fight drug test, he tested positive for THC, and it was like there was a threshold of what was acceptable, and it was he was something like ten times. And based, that meant he was like he was high during the fight. Exactly, yeah, and okay. that's what they were. That's what the argument was, right? And I, I wish I knew who the heck he fought. They ended up cutting him after it because of the fact that it was a drug violation. And he, I think, he went and fought in Pride, and then they brought him back after, or when he when Pride got bought, he got bought back on with the roster, and then that's that's how they ended up keeping sure. him. But um, both the Diaz brothers, those are dudes that. They're not out there like a Connor. They, they just talk shit, dude. They talk shit, and they're t- they're they're all fucking hard to beat. Um, but Nate asked for that to be five rounds. It's the first yeah. time it's ever happened that it wasn't a title and it wasn't a main event. It well, wasn't a fight. It was the only fight ever to be five rounds that wasn't a main event or a title fight. Because I mean, that's uh, the fight against uh, Jorge was three rounds, and he was and people were saying that was a five rounder. But no, he that went was down, three. He went down in the fourth. And the Mazda fight. Yeah, I'll pull it up. Was that the that was the main main event of that fight? Yeah, that was uh the MSG one. Because remember, it was supposed to be Diaz Poyer. The what was the fight that I'm thinking of? That was he it went three rounds and who did he fight before Masvidal? It was the fight before that Anthony? Yeah, but he won that fight. He won that one. It was a three rounder. Yeah, there was some. I could have sworn Masvidal was three rounds that that he, that he was complaining that people were like saying that it should it should have gone five because. He only gets started in the later rounds. It was a, uh, it was the medical stoppage because his ah the cut yeah. yeah. So it went from coming out of the third Thank round. You, never mind, I was wrong. Um, coming out <laughs> of the third, on. going into the fourth. I'm trying to pull up Sheer Dog right now. Here we That's go. Little thing. Well, it's the only place I can really find all the information I need. So yeah, medical stoppage. Oh fuck you with this continue to share dog they get so mad about my ad blockers uh let's see november 2nd 2019 medical stoppage tko stoppage uh mergliata yeah so it was third round going into the fourth it was okay. a medical stoppage cool. and then before that he fought anthony 
won before that, fought Connor, fought Connor again, Michael Johnson before that. Yeah. Yeah, dude, he's fought RDA, lost to RDA. Yeah, before Connor and Michael Johnson, his last win was uh, Gray Maynard. Thompson beat him. Benson Henderson beat him. Yes. But that was at a lightweight, though. Yeah. Then, from, yeah. then he moved up for a counter the ones that they didn't go back down. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was a good fight, though. I mean, uh, like you said, 23 minutes of pain, then two minutes of glory. And, but I think 49 46 is a pretty accurate call for Edwards. That, that wasn't a, you know, it's no one wants to fight that guy. You know, now, now he's going to, he's an all but guaranteed title shot after the, I think Colby and Kamaru is going to fight again. And then, yeah. And then I think he's going to fight whoever, which, now you look at Diaz. I'm sorry. I hope that burp didn't come through. Um, <laughs> you look at Diaz, though. Where does he go? I mean, he's got... Connor's still there. He's got the Connor trilogy that he can do. You know what? Come to think of it, though, I would do... Uh, if Diaz is doing 155 again, I would do him and Ferguson. Okay. I think that'd be a banger. Tony's, and, yeah, well, well, Tony's not getting a title shot ever again. That, that, that's, that, 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 that ship sailed. Here's the thing. If they're not going to get title shots, who the fuck cares? Give Give... Give them fights that people want to see. Freaking Bam Bam's fighting uh, Greg Hardy. Jesus Christ! Yeah, yeah it's little as he with Vasa against Greg Hardy, and then I think it's on, I think it's in the next. It might be on the next pay per view actually. Oh, that'll be a that'll be a banger. Yeah. So I mean, this, <laughs> and Bam Bam wasn't. I think, I think I'm not sure if he's still ranked top 15, but at one point in time he was top 10. Yeah. And now he's fighting Greg Hardy. So whatever. <laughs> they're still making. They're still giving him a push. I mean, the, him being a former NFL player is, is what helps him a lot. Yeah. Um, moving back to Diaz, I mean, I would say. If he's going to 155, give him a give him Tony Ferguson. You have the potential of doing another Connor fight. If you're gonna do that Connor fight, you definitely want to do that 155. Um, what else is there? You could do Jorge, Jorge Again, Diaz too for the for the BMF point two or the that dumb thing is. You could, I mean, potentially you could do that. I mean, everyone had the argument where, but here's the thing though: Nick was getting or Nick Nate was getting his ass kicked that entire fight. Oh yeah. Um, it, wasn't, think, it wasn't a fight. Yeah. I, you want to do that one, you could. I think that'd be kind of a money grab, but yeah. You, I would say take a look at Poyer Connor. Connor loses. I do Connor Diaz. They're both coming off of L's. Let him, let him do the trilogy. Let him make some money. I think everyone would tune in for that. Let that. But again, you do that one at 155 instead of 170. But do you want to stay that? Do you want to take Connor that direction for the money grab, or do you want to have Connor Chandler? I would do Chandler uh, if Connor beats Gaethje. Poirier. No, I would do Connor. Uh, I'm sorry. If uh, Chandler Gaethje, just regardless. Yeah, I want to see that, with one. that. I want to see that one. I think that'd be a scrap because they're both they're both dangerous with their hands and they're both phenomenal. So you're saying like Connor Poirier would be like a title contender for the next thing for Du Bronx? Yeah, I would okay. say. Okay. Uh, Whoever yeah. wins that, have him fight Oliveira. Because that was the option that Poyer had. Uh, Poyer could have either fought McGregor or he could fight. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, he yeah, He could yeah. fight the winner of Chandler like, Oliveira. Yeah, yeah. So, fuck it. You go, <laughs> let's say hypothetically Poyer wins. You go Oliveira, Poyer, and then you go, all right, Diaz, McGregor, let's do this trilogy. You get an automatic pay-per-view right there. We don't have to worry about doing a title shot on it. No. And shit like that. So, you go, cool. There you go. Maybe do that for the next international fight week. Have everyone come out to Vegas. Have that, hopefully, that international uh, crowd coming back uh, in 2022. There you go. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, the last one I was going to bring up was Stylebender. That yeah. was a boring fight. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I'm not, not lying to you. I went to bed at, uh, after the fourth round. I was like, I'm done. It was just... You want to see more, but then you realize, like... I was I, I we all know how good Izzy's anti wrestling is, but then like he swept uh Vittori twice yeah. from the ground. I was like, okay, so he's taking some no gi classes. But beyond that, it was he was just picking his shots, he was kind of laughing at him. It wasn't really you've seen like it was the Adasanya train, just that rocket ship took off, and Vittori's more like a slow, steady he's improved. I mean, his fight against Hermison was great. Since then, he's had a couple good wins, but then, but just, I mean, pew, with the, the, the Adesanya train went, went to the roof. I mean, he's just he improved every fight from the Gaslam fight on. It's just, it's just it's been the Izzy show, and well, I guess he fights Whitaker again. Whitaker again. That wasn't even a fight though. That he he knocked his block off the last fight. Whit- Whitaker is uh, Whitaker's been looking really good. 
Um, as far as Izzy Whitaker goes, say, uh, do it again. I mean, he's the number one contender. Uh, he's been looking strong. Do I see it going any differently? Not really. No. <laughs> but, I mean, anything can happen. Anything yeah. can happen. Um, I know Adesanya had had, had kind of rallied for that one being... Um, I'm not, not in Fiji. Um, New Zealand. Yeah. He's rallying for that one. I don't know what the rules are for all that for, for international oh, travel it's and, and whatnot. Cool. It's, all, it's also confusing. Yeah. So, maybe, maybe not. But, I mean, it'd be great to... If you're going to do an international fight, have, you know, those two guys do it over there. I would totally do that. Um, as far as anyone in that division, anyone else for Stylebender, ugh, I don't really <laughs> have an answer. Um, and as far as the rest of the card goes, by the way, shout out to Bilal. I don't know what happened at the end of that, uh, at the end of the fight. I don't know if ABC, ESPN ran out of time. I don't think they were trying to... Uh, they were trying to shut him down because obviously he's Palestinian and everything that's going on overseas right now. I don't think they were purposely trying to um, trying to uh, mute him or anything like that. I think just due to broadcasting, they just ran out of time and they weren't able to do his post fight interview. Um, hopefully, he can uh, he's able to get on a platform and, and bring attention to what's going on. He's been one of the biggest supporters for uh, for for finding a. Uh, for settling all that stuff over there between Israel and, and Palestine. And he's got a podcast as well. Uh, you check him out. He talks about it on there and hopefully he'll be able to uh, shed a little more light on it, but super proud of him. Former Rupert sport guy. Uh, he's training mostly in Chicago now, but yeah, great fight. I was really hoping to see him finish Maya, uh, but he had, yeah, but he had amazing takedown defense. And that was the big thing coming out, coming away from two sixty three. two things. Izzy has great takedown defense. Well, I should say, Take down defense and is able to pop back up pretty well. Yes. And Bilal might be the hardest guy to take down in the division. Period. Great balance. Great balance on his one. The single leg. That was he fought the single leg a thousand times. And he did I think I think it was like like twenty seven take down attempts, landed two. Yeah. That's the real the real funny <laughs> part was uh I was laughing and I turned around to uh to Cassidy and I was like I was like, I wonder if uh if Damien had heard Paul Felder, because Paul Felder has had Paul Felder obviously trained with Bilal through Rufus Sport, sure. but he had said, he goes, yeah, he goes, you're not going to take Bilal down with a single leg. You're going to have to switch to a double. And then all of a sudden you see Damian Maia switch <laughs> to a double. And I was like, I was like, Paul, I was like, you're close enough for him to fucking hear you, bro. Hey, <laughs> but, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. But yeah. With, with no crowd, probably for sure. Yeah. With the crowd, who knows? Yeah. I, I wasn't sure, but it was, it was funny That's where funny. it was just like, he switched to a double leg just as he said it. And I was like, Paul, shut the fuck up. dude. <laughs> Stop giving away the secrets. Uh, amazing card, 263. Shout out to, uh, I forgot his name, and I didn't pull up the notes on it. You have a Ukrainian uh, welterweight champion over in uh, Bellator now. Uh, Douglas Lima lost yes, in Bellator did. on Friday night. I watched that last night, finally, just because I was DJing out in, uh, out in Okachi Lake on Friday. Shout out to the guys from Hideaway. Those guys were partying their asses off. Shout out to Nathan Potter. I didn't realize he was working there. Shout out to Scott Cron. <laughs> And the whole crew over there, I had a blast there Friday night. Looking forward to doing it again next month as well. Um, what else did I have going on? I think that was it as far as the, the fights go. Yeah. Anything else that stuck out for you outside of the fact that uh, Hill got his arm broken? Joanne Calderwood looked crispy. Hey, Lauren Murphy, man. Five-fight win streak. Unfortunately, she has to run into the Kyrgyzstani buzzsaw, Tiger Muay Thai's very own Valentina Shevchenko, who I still... I think it's the pound for pound best fighter on the planet. Her fight IQ is to a level that's terrifying. I mean, she grew up with her sister kicking trees in the freaking forest, man. Yeah. Those people are different. They're, they're, they're different kind of hard. Um, so it's, it doesn't matter who. who it, this is in another division where the, she's the queen. It's like good luck. Yeah. Valentina's. I saw Valentina fight. The pictures just came up the other day. Uh, shout out to our good friend, Lindsay. Um, we went to the UFC Chicago card two or three years ago, and that was when uh, Valentina. Uh, just fucking stretch Jessica I that yeah that rear leg head kick that literally yeah, wasn't, skipped it, it, off it, her head. It wasn't a, it wasn't a fight. It's like it's and it's, at one twenty five she locked in. It's just it's yeah. it's the queen. There's no I don't see anyone in that. No. It's it's weird because we say this now and then a year or two from now it changes. But you said the same thing with uh, Joanna Yojengchek. You know at one fifteen there wasn't anyone 
that you saw that was the answer for her. And then all come all along comes little Rose Namajunas yeah. f- fucking finishes her. Finishers and then fights her again. I think they went to a decision the second time. I don't remember. I, I might have still won though. Still won. Still won. And then loses to Andraj. Mm-hmm. Andraj uses to uh Zhang Li. Uh, Zhang Wei Li. Zhang Wei Li, thank you. And then she goes on a tear. Yeah. She beats Ioana. Well, ar- arguably one of the best, not best female fights, one of the best fights of all time. The first minute was chaos. Yeah. Un- just, just unbridled chaos. And then Zhang Wei loses via switch kick to fucking Rose. Yeah. Rose wins it back. You know, so you take a look at you take a look at the those these divisions. There, there are the the people are on top. I don't see anyone that can compete with Valentina, whether it's striking. I mean, we just learned in her last fight she's a really good grappler. She's very good. Yeah, has amazing top control. Who, who? I don't see anyone that can beat her right now. Um, and and here's the thing: the women's division is still developing, but I think in in one fifteen, there's great competition, and one thirty five, no competition. No. Uh, 125. Valentina's. I I don't see anyone beating her anytime soon. Um, yeah, arguably. Yeah, you could make an argument between her and Amanda. Um, what the hell, Nunez? Yeah, you could make a, a argument between Nunez. A be- I mean, obviously she's a goat, but Valentina is a strong second. They fought twice, 135. I thought Valentina won the second one, but. Yeah. It's that that's I don't think that'll be a fight she's taking. Nunes is in mom mode now. Yeah, she's kind of checked out. Is she is she done? Because I, I know she I know they took away the 145 division after her last fight with uh, Megan Anderson. Megan, yeah. Shout out to Factory X. Um, yeah, I know they dropped the 145 division. I don't know if she's still fighting. I, I it'd heard, be bantamweight if anything. I haven't heard any bantamweight fights in a while though. Yeah. I know Misha Tate's coming back. It's all I know. They might have just paid her to come back and be like, you want to fight Amanda again? Might as well. Yeah. There's no one. I don't see anyone else coming up in that division either. The 115's always just been stacked. But now they're talk, there's rumblings about uh, the 105 division. They're bringing Adam Waite to UFC? Yeah. So right. Laura Laura Sanko, uh, yeah. UFC She's, commentator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she had, made, she had made a post saying that she was getting ready for uh, an Adam Waite fight. And I was just like, okay. An Invicta or? No, no, for UFC. Okay. So the UFC is introducing that. Invicta, Callie brought this up the other day. Invicta had a show and we had no idea that it was coming up at all. And they only had six fights on it. So as much as Invicta had always been like a really great promotion for women. Yeah. They're starting to fall to the wayside. And they're, they're kind of a, a feeding. Um, Not kind of, they are. For the UFC, yeah, that's where Megan Anderson came from. That's where that's her last two opponents came from. Yeah. yeah, but they didn't resign her, and they kind of let her go free agent. So I don't know what she's doing now. I don't know if she's going to go over to Bellator, if she's going to go to One FC or or whatnot. But yeah, Megan's Megan's good, but she's not like dangerous like a cyborg. Like, no, no, no. Uh, Nunez. That's not know? a fight for her. Her cyborg would take her head off. Yeah, but again, you look at cyborg over in Bellator. She just fought. Uh, I think it was Leslie Smith. Leslie Smith again, yeah. They went five rounds, they did. but uh, Cyborg was able to get it done. I think she had like fifteen seconds left left and finished her. Yeah, but again, who, there's no one for Cyborg to fight either. Those divisions still need to still need to develop with with fighters. Um, PFL is looking good for the 145 for women's. They have this. Blonde Beast. I forgot what her name was. The Judoka. She won a gold medal yeah. for the U.S. She um, won two of them. Yeah. Yeah. I feel horrible. I don't know her name. Now I'm sitting here stumbling over it. Yeah. But she's in that, that tournament. Um, shout out to Laura Sanchez. Kayla, Kayla. Is it Kayla Harris? I was going to say Kara Har- Harris or Harrison. Kayla. Har- yeah. I think it's Kayla Harrison. Yeah. Sorry if it's not. Yeah. My, my apologies. Yeah. I didn't I didn't think I was going to be talking PFL. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Laura Sanchez. Yeah, went, huh? yeah. Laura Sanchez is in that group. Um, Clo- Clo- uh, Clarissa Shields had her first fight on she did. Best Friday. Um, she fought. 
follow the girl on Instagram and I forgot what her name is. Yeah, and the uh, women's lightweight, 155 for women actually, yeah. PFL. I was talking to, to Kush about that and he was explaining to me like the one, the women's 155 division is nothing like the men's 155 division. 155 division for men's is stacked, but he has essentially explained to me, he's like the 155 for women's is kind of like heavyweight for men. He's just like, those girls right. just hit hard. And you take a look at like a girl like Kayla Harris. I hope that's her. Harrison, Kayla Harris. Ka- we'll just call her Kayla. <laughs> um, from PFL, you know, that's a girl who has amazing takedown ability because of the fact that she's a, uh, a judo player, two-time gold medalist. And she, that's a girl that still hits hard, too. She gets that side control, and she just starts smashing chicks. I think she finished her last fight via... Armbar? I, th- I watched it. It is Kelly Harrison, by the way. Harrison? Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there's not a... Like, there's girls in these divisions that are just scary, but it's kind of like... It's kind of like boxing. They're all in their own other promotions. Yeah. And it's hard to get them all to fight together. I will say this. Uh, talking, unifying, shout out to little Sergio Pettis. I shouldn't call him little. The guy's a fucking beast. Well, he's the man now. Yeah, he's, uh, he's fighting in Bellator. has the 135 title. Um, and then they're talking about unifying it with Ryzen. So he's going to he's going to fight the champion of Ryzen. I think he's doing this in July or okay. August. Yeah. And in a cross promotion, like a, like a WWE thing. Well, it's not like, well, isn't I think Ryzen's owned by Bell by Viacom. I don't know. It could be. I have to look into the details of it. You know what? Maybe I'll just have Sergio come on. I'll be like, hey, dude, come on before you yeah. explain all this <laughs> shit to me. Would you spill some beans? Yeah. Explain to me how this shit works. But just no beans somewhere. Actually, I totally forgot to plug it. The last time, uh, the last time we were on, he won. Shout out to him. Um, yeah, Bellator. We man, we covered a little bit of everything. I'm all over the board. Yeah, I? we all. Yeah, absolutely love it. Well, that that was the fun part about this is that I was just like, we're gonna talk about a little bit of everything. Yeah, little fights here, little fights there. Um, little road trip into Green Bay. <laughs> yeah. For those of you who don't know, uh, Chicago Nick, Chicago Nick, and I. We're blessed upon each other. We were introduced to each other by uh by Joe Katz from it was the West. Me. You were Wes's boy first. Yeah, I was. Oh yeah, because like I would come and I'd watch the games with him over at the Highbury back in the day, and yeah. he was just like, he's like, you're a night fan. He's like, you're hanging with us, and I was like, all right, Wes Mooney, and yeah. then I'd hang out with him, and then everyone would start singing the Wes Mooney song. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> God, that guy. Dude, shout out to Wes Mooney. We gotta send him a copy of this episode and be sure. like. We're, He'll be like, bro, you're shooting me out, man. <laughs> well, the, no, the first time we hung out, you were, you, you got it. With, so we're taking the bus. It was the biggest fire match in 10 years, non playoff bound. Because what happened was Freddie Lundberg got signed by the fire, huge Arsenal legend. Thierry Henry got signed by New York Red Bulls. Mm-hmm. Him and, um, uh, Alan Shearer, the first two players to be inducted in the Premier League Hall of Fame. So, obviously, one of the greatest footballers, one of the greatest French footballers of all time, one of the greatest Premier League players of all time, inarguably pains me to say it. Mm-hmm. He gets signed by New York Red Bulls. The Red Bulls are playing the fire. There's talk that Henri might actually get on the pitch. He was willing to clear for medical, et cetera, et cetera. But Lundberg was there, whatever. So, Joe organizes a coach bus to go on the fire game. You showed up on your Harley <laughs> with your yellow goggles on. And your riding gloves that had spikes across the knuckle bed. <laughs> you get like fourth row in the back left corner and you pass completely out. And I was like, who's this fucking guy sleeping in the back? That bus ride was unhinged. We were stuck in traffic from the moment we hit Racine to the border because a car flipped off the road. Mm-hmm. Joe generously gave us like 10 cases of Paps and like five bottles of Jameson and a bottle of this stuff called Baron Yager. Never had Baron Yager before. It's a honey liqueur that, if served chilled, tastes like cold sap. It's some weird shit that we drank all the time at like four in the morning at the pub, being shots before matches. We go through all that before we cross the goddamn border to Illinois. We had the bus driver pull over in some like rinky dink liquor store in Bridgeport, Illinois, which is not a nice area, by the way. I only had the fire match. Park the bus and then just proceed to plow through all of that, hanging out the Section 8 tailgate. Then we go to the game. Then we head back on the bus. God knows what happened at the game. I couldn't tell you what the result was. I don't remember. 
you and I happen to buy the same flags. Yeah. With Stewie on them because from the uh, supporters group Section 8. And then it just, to hell with the spiral from there for some well, I, reason. So I remember at one point, because I'd, I'd gotten on the bus and I went I went directly into the back and I passed out. Yeah. And, and people were like, what the fuck's with this guy being passed out, so on and so forth. And Wes was like, dude, leave him the fuck alone. <laughs> and they're like... Like, what the fuck? Like, someone kept trying to put a beer in my hand. And Probably. I think, and yeah. I kept, like, shoving whoever it was. And Wes is like, dude, leave him the fuck alone. He's going to wake up and beat the shit out of you. <laughs> and Wes knew me. He knew my background, so on and so forth. What no one knew was the fact that I think Joe had texted me at, like, 4 in the morning. and was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm up drinking. I, get, yeah. I think I was waiting for Zad to open up. He's like, go catch a nap. We're going to Chicago. And I was like, all right, sounds good. So I literally woke up. Jumped on my bike because I didn't know where my car was. Yeah. Jumped on my bike, took it to the Highbury, and like literally gave Joe like 50 bucks or whatever it was to get on the bus and hopped on. And I was just like, yeah, I'm going to go pass out for a couple hours before this game. So when everyone was singing and cheering oh, and, yeah. and whatnot, I slept clean through it. I woke up in Chicago, yeah. got off the bus, and I think you handed me a beer. And you're like, you're friends with Wes? We're cool. And I was like, yeah. all right, man. <laughs> that sounds all right, yeah. We got off the bus, and you made me shotgun a beer. And I was like, all right, cool. That sounds and, all right, yeah. And then you're like, have you ever been here before? And I was like, no. I was like, I've never been to a Chicago Fire game. So having you and Wes as like kind of like my liaisons, you're like, okay, we want to go over here. This guy has like elk burgers and like this, that, and the other. Oh, yeah. It was, just, it was, just, it was the uh, Section 8 tailgate. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, 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 at that point in time, I had season tickets for like a decade. So – Walking around with you and Wes, it was like, all right, we want to go do this. We got to go say hi to Peter Wilt. We got to go do shots with yeah, him, so on and so forth. Peter. And that's where I actually met Peter the first time. Actually, shout out to Peter. He's going to be here in two weeks. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over how the Chicago Fire started and then talk that's to him. A, that's a story from him about what happened to him with that. Yeah. Was, that, was very, that was not good. And then I want to talk to him about uh, Madison, Indianapolis, and all the other teams that he started across the And Midwest. the invention of the schlaps. The schlaps? You know about schlaps? I'm not. I'm unfamiliar. There's literally a shirt that they sold the hybrid school that says the schlaps. I never understood what it that was, was about. It was Milwaukee's black and tan. Oh, so okay. So it's a mixture of three of the trash beers of the planet. It's Schlitz, PBR, and Blatz. <laughs> All Milwaukee board beers. And instead of like a half black and tan, which is half harp, half Guinness, he would do the bottom half. I, again, you can ask him about the, about the rest of the beer because it was very delicate. I saw him in the back room by the back window of the Highbury perfecting this one day. Just getting flat line. It was like there's like ten cans of Blatz, ten Tall Boys of Schlitz, and like five PBR cans are on him perfecting this recipe of like one third PBR, like another third of Schlitz, and like a dash of Blatz, <laughs> inventing the Schlaps. Whatever it was, it, Joe had on special for like a buck one time because like I just got to get rid of the stock. Yeah, so they're all drinking schlaps in Peter Wilt's honor one time. Or some <laughs> I don't know. It, it, there, 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 there. We, we can be here for a day and a half speaking about the night that uh, uh, Bayern Munich played. Um, uh, it was um, Tel, uh, not a Tel Aviv. Um, who's the team that Stoudemire played for in uh, in Israel? The, the, it's the best football team in Israel. I feel bad. No, they have like a, a football team. They also have like a, a basketball team. Uh, it was it was Bayern Munich against like the Israeli champions in the Champions League. And Joe called it... Uh, oh, man, I feel so bad. I can't remember the name of this team. So Joe, we know, is a Jewish man. And he brought in a bunch of... like He brought a menorah and a bunch of yarmulkes for me and Ike to wear. And we were drinking like... We are spinning the dreidel... And he called it, uh, it, it was like Berlin versus like the team in Israel, like the second coming. His parents came in for the match and we're drinking and having the greatest time, like singing Havan the Gila, just having time of our lives. <laughs> and then uh, like all the Bayern Munich fans are loving it. Joe's over all like his parents, like these people are crazy. Like, yeah, we're just having the time of our life. And Joe's like, yeah, we love it so much. Like, like this like non-Jewish people being Jewish fans. It was just a lot of fun. But yeah, so like there, there's so many of those, those those wild days of just God knows what the hell happened. But yeah, that was the that was the, that fire match. That was the impetus of everything. Yeah, and that's that's kind of where everything started between us because it was me, you, and Wes in the section eight, up in the section eight area for the fan section, and they have this they have this huge flag that like they brought up from the front row. The tifo, yeah, went yeah. up to the top, over the top of the rows, yeah. And Wes and I decided to use it as a good cover. To smoke weed. <laughs> so, yeah, cool. They had it in the, the entire uh, the, the anthems, yeah. Yeah, so everyone's singing, and we're just passing the bowl back and forth and geeking our asses off. 
And then there was some dude in a Fernando Torres jersey that was sitting right in front of us who we managed to um, to harass the entire time. Oh, yeah. This had to be 2007 or 2000. Maccabi 2000? Haifa was a team, my fault. I was looking it up, and I couldn't yeah. figure out who Maccabi Haifa. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, after that, we ended up uh, we ended up getting the supporters' um, scarves. We got a bunch of photos taken uh, together and stuff like that. And then I would just run into you randomly yeah. at the Highbury. And it was one of those, well, hey, dude, do you want to go drink? And it would be like, well, let's go to Vitucci's on a Thursday night and see what the fuck's happening. Yeah. Perhaps we can find a tall girl in a jean skirt. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Which, and then pay off the DJ who was singing karaoke to not play Pour Some Sugar on Me for the 9,000th time. It was Girls, Girls, oh, Girls. it was. The most shitty that, single mom song. Wait, did we hit a... We had to have hit a... I think that was the day that we hit the Brewers game beforehand. No, 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 no. Brewers game was... Oh, was, no, it was the, the next day. It was the next day, yeah. No, that was... So, no, but the day before that, that was... That was... That... That was the month before Chicharito got signed by United. Mm-hmm. And then it was you, me, and Silky Pete and Ike wore ponchos Joe's and, and some sombre- sombreros <laughs> and fake mustaches. And we were slamming modelos. <laughs> and those two, those twins, those Mexican guys that hung out at the pub all the time. I just saw one of them the other day. Yeah. They came in and we were just like, we were going nuts because they were like hyped that there was like this like awesome Mexican player in the, in the, uh, in the Premier League. And we were just slamming tequila because Joe, his shot was Casadores. Yeah. So we were drinking shots of Casadores and slamming modelos wearing, totally appropriating the Mexican culture. Those guys were loving it. Everyone was having a great time. Yeah. And just singing like for Chicharito playing. That was like, that was the first time he played was the community shield against Chelsea, and he had the, he kicked the ball off his face and went to the goal. Yeah, that was his first game for United. Well, his his first game with United was the MLS All Star game, the tour, yeah, the summer yeah, tour, the tour, yeah. and they gave him, they gave him the ball right off, like I think the first pass, and like within forty seconds he ran up the pitch and just fucking yeah. scored. And I had seen ch- there was rumors that Chicharito was going to get s- get signed to United. I remember watching him play in the World Cup that summer, and in the World Cup he was he was lights out. Yeah, he was. I think he had like three or four goals during the World Cup, and I was like, we signed this fucking guy. It's like he's one, and they had clocked him. He was one of the fastest players. Oh yeah, for the World Cup for for any of the teams, he was like he ran like the fastest forty or some shit like I that. It. And I was like, oh shit, we signed this guy. I was like fuck yeah. And then I saw him in the MLS game, and I was like, dude, this guy just scored a goal in 40 seconds against the MLS All-Stars in Dallas. And then that was the day that he made his debut with United, or I should say in the EPL, where I, that had to be the beginning of the season. Because it wasn't a mid-season transfer. Yeah, because it was summertime. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no. His first game was a community shield against Chelsea. He came out a super sub. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah, but United always used the World Cup as like a farm system. That's how we signed Ronaldo. It was in 06 when he had his first start for Portugal in the 06 World Cup, and then he was still playing with Sporting Lisbon, and we signed him that summer. Do you think he's going over? To, he's going back to yes. United? Yeah. It's, it's going to be a Pogba, Pogba, and Pogba plus cash for uh, – sorry, it's going to be a Pogba plus cash for Ronaldo. Is Ronaldo going to go midfield then? Because, well, actually, you know what? In the midfield area, we don't really need Pogba anymore. He'll be on the left, and Rash will be on the right. Ooh. And Bruno up the middle. And then Marcial will probably get demoted. Lin, Lingard's going to get permanently transferred to West Ham like he should because he gets a lot of time there. And Marcial, my favorite player, unfortunately, just keeps getting hurt and can't keep form. I don't know who yeah. else. Well, I mean, here's the thing. The United team's super young. Um, McTomahay, youngest, youngest in the Prem. Yeah. McTomahay's got a lot of potential. So. I, dude, Daniels is fucking fast. Dude. Daniel James? Yeah. Yes. Very, very fast. But He's fast. I like him. Uh, he actually had a good game the other day. Um, uh, who did Wales, Wales play? They lost. But uh, he, he had a really they good game. played France. Yeah, he had, he, had, he had a good game for Wales. Yeah. Uh, yeah, dude, that Christian Eriksen thing was fucking crazy. We were talking about that before the podcast. Yeah. It's uh, unfortunate stuff. He's probably not going to play again. That's that's He won't get medically cleared. He he, he, he was dead. He was, he was dead. Yeah, they were before doing the, che- Before the game CPR. He was out. He was yeah, they were doing chest compressions on the field. Uh, Vin Conolato. Uh, talked to me about that last night from uh, Red Bull. And I knew about what happened, that he had collapsed on the pitch and whatnot. And uh, I didn't hear what the verdict was. And he's like, yeah, he had a fucking heart attack. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's a genetic thing or what the deal was or supplements or, you know, you never want to see that. I was watching the replay today and they just said, you know, he just collapsed. Yeah. And it was because of lack of oxygen to the brain. And, and that's 
what had happened. And then when they found out they didn't have a pulse, they started doing compressions on the on the side of the pitch. You know, a player legally or technically being dead is nothing to uh, nothing you ever want to see. No. Um, you know, shout out to that team though. They they went on the pitch. Yes, was that yesterday or today? It was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. they played Finland. They, they lost. Played. They they shouldn't have played that game. Yeah. Um, they still came out and and shit like that and crowd was up on their feet showing love and respect but uh yeah you never want to see that danish right yes yeah, yeah danish yeah. but uh yeah man that that's tough but uh the euros euros are going on uh um, euros it's the it's the best international like continent tournament i'm sorry nobody cares about Concacaf except maybe 10 people common bowl has its moments african cup of nations is fun no one watches the oceanic cup no one watches the asian cup it's all yeah. about euro everyone knows that I'm sorry. You, it's it's just this. <laughs> I was going to hold out to talk to uh, talk to Peter about this. What was your take on that whole Super League thing uh, a couple of weeks ago? I don't know what even happened. All I know is that a bunch of bunch of like I guess Juve and Barca and somebody else and Inter are getting fined like twenty million euro and like possibly a points deduction. It was it, it made it sound like they want to have like an all star league with like the best teams in Europe. Mm-hmm. Because I, I I I personally love watching young boys play Dortmund and mm-hmm. like uh Hertha Berlin somehow sneak in the Champions League and play like PSV Eindhoven or uh Siska Moscow play like um Panathaikos. I think those matches are great. I don't want to see Juve play City every year and Arsenal play Berlin every year. It's just like ugh. that's like that, that's like watching basketball in the 80s. It was the Celtics and Lakers every single year. You that's the whole beauty of the Champions League is same thing with the FA Cup. Like this past year like there were three teams from the fifth division that made it to the sixth round. Yeah. That's the FA Cup. Like, Arsenal got knocked out, which good, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Arsenal got knocked out, like, in the third round, good. Like, they, like by some, like, like fourth division team. That's the, that's the beauty of it. You never, every, any, any given game, I don't want to, I don't want an all-star club league. It's just, like, these guys, think about it one, think about it one year. So, this, this past year. Well, okay, cancel this year. 2019. Uh, who will be a good player to have an example for? Um... Let's go with let's go with Rashford. There you go, Rashford. So for United, he plays the Premier League, the Carabao Cup. What the fuck that is? The FA Cup, Champions League, international friendlies, and World Cup qualifying, and European League of Nations. That's seven leagues he's playing in the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna add in like an eighth. Like these guys, like this 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 next coming summer because of the World Cup qualifying, they're gonna have like a one month holiday and then back to the Prem. It's like, geez, I mean, who's just the the person at FIFA who's scheduling this? Good on them. I uh, I thought with the Super League, those teams were leaving the EPL to go play in this league permanently, and that's they believe in UEFA. Oh, they'd be leaving UEFA. So okay. they, they, they would, they would, they would, and they even if they finish top four in their respective leagues, whether it's Serie A or you know EPL, League Un, yeah. or the the Bundesliga, they would leave. They would not qualify for yep. UEFA meaning like instead of one say say the top four feet uh the EPL is like City United Arsenal and Chelsea and they all went to the Super League whoever was fifth would go to the Champions League yeah no that's 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 just silly but whatever yeah I thought they were leaving EPL that's why I was like ugh. I was like I don't know here's the thing for me I love United but like I also love watching the EPL so it was one of those that was like I was concerned about the fact that I was like, well, I'm not going to see West Ham play United. I'm not going to see all these teams. Right. Yeah, no, it, it, it would, they, would, they would still play the EPL, but they wouldn't have they wouldn't play in the European Championship. Okay. They'd have like their own side championship of what arguably are always quote unquote the last eight teams every year. You know, the Real Madrids, the Atletico Madrids, PSG, Inter, Bayern Munich. You know. Ajax once in a while, like those types of teams would, would always play like in their own tournament off to the side, which is the dumbest thing. I was going to say, it's a money grab. Did uh, did PSG and AC Milan finally bow out of that? Because the last I heard, they hadn't. I think they're like the last man standing for some reason. And then they're getting hit pretty hard by UEFA for fines. I think again, I once United thankfully pulled out of that even conversation. I was very happy, and I kind of tuned out afterwards. To be honest with you, same, same. Because I like I just kept hearing that like other teams were still signed. I was like. I thought when the English teams bowed out, I thought everyone was done. But apparently, there were still a couple of people that were hanging on to it. Yeah, um, yeah man, this this is crazy. 
but euros euros are looking good euros are looking good i'm excited to, to see how the rest of this goes um i'm gonna miss whatever t- matches are going on tomorrow i'm gonna do a kayak trip nice shout out to uncle dave he's in town from santa barbara so yeah. uh, i'm gonna do uh i'm gonna get matt olson and the crew together and we're gonna do a like a, probably like a six seven hour kayak trip cool. and then grab some food afterwards I uh what else was i gonna bring up oh yeah i was gonna bring up i was gonna bring up some stories we're gonna bring up some stories <laughs> um one of my favorite road trips ever was uh, we went up to Green Bay and we watched the greatest show on turf, the Women's Laundry Egg Football League. The le- the, what, no, it was called the Legends Football League, wasn't it? Or was it the I thought, I thought it was the Laundry. It was on MTV2. That's the only thing I remember <laughs> about it. It's on ESPN The Ocho. It was on ESPN The Ocho oh, and MTV2. Man. And friends of mine were texting me going, are you guys in the end zone? And I went, yeah. yeah and they're like, we are. like, we can see you guys. And you guys are like visibly hammered which we were we started pre- we were tailgating at a, at a lfa game man like legit LFL, whatever i think we were the only people tailgating that it was me you uh reverend sean who i think we got the tickets from i think one of the girls from silk i don't even know if i was supposed to uh, i don't think i was supposed to say that but whatever say what one, mm-hmm. one i think one of the uh one of the i think she was a receiver or she was a running back she was one of the dancers at Silk, and he had gotten tickets from her. And then we went up to Green Bay, and we went and watched this, and we we tailgated right by Lambeau Field. <laughs> yeah, the parking lot next to their uh, like their practice field. Yeah, or the Pepsi Center. So we were out there grilling. We're killing cases of beer. We're the only people out there, and then of course we stumbled into the arena where I think we were all of like three hundred people. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it was. I mean it wasn't. I wasn't that low, but I, I know what you're saying. It was definitely not a not a packed house. It was the Green Bay Chill versus the Minnesota whatever. I don't yeah. know. Minnesota something. Lady Vikings. I don't know what it was. I, I, I couldn't Minnesota. even tell you if Green Bay won the game or not. Um, we I was browned out for most <laughs> for most of the game. I was I was doing my best to cheer on who I thought were the Green Bay Chill. Yeah. Um, and then afterwards, shout dude, shout to uh, Zach DJ Deville. He was playing up in Green Bay that night, so we went to go see him. What was that club called? Was that Fire? What was it called? Or Fuego or f- something? Or <laughs> I don't know what that club was called. The place was funny. Though. I just I just remembered there there was a couple of things I remembered. I remember we were because we were listening to a bunch of Hollywood on Dead at the time, and I think this was two thousand eight, two thousand nine. That's because you mixed that video of those guys dressed as um, fast food mascots having like a party out in the night. Brad to- Omen. To that song, and I was like, "What is this music? This is awesome!" And that was my introduction to Hollywood Undead. Yeah, and there was like a guy in a Ronald McDonald costume doing lines of blow with a guy dressed as Wendy, and you mixed uh, "Coming in Hot" by Hollywood Undead over the top of that, and I was like, <laughs> "What?" I, I wasn't sure if I was awake or dreaming or what the hell was going on, but it was unmitigated, unadulterated fun and hilarity. And then that that song somehow translated transfer, translated into my anthem for the evening. I couldn't even tell you. I don't know. The spirit just took hold of me. I don't know what it was. Oh, and I'm it pulling just, it up right now. It was just, yeah, I, 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 yeah. It was it was so bizarre. Yeah, the, 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 guy, the guy was like, yeah, the guy's like. Popping. I can't do I can't do the audio. I'll get flagged by YouTube. But yeah, Randon, go wide shot for me, would you? Thanks, homie. Yeah. So that's Simon Rex. Yeah. I forgot who that is, but it's it, yeah. There's the Burger King. It's all the fast food guys, Ronald Sanders. McDonald. Yeah. It's Colonel Sanders. Yeah. Like Cassidy. Uh, the Jack in the Box. Yeah. <laughs> Cassidy, Nine Toes, and uh, Loftus. We were all talking about doing this for a Halloween one year. Yeah. They did a bunch of drugs, went out on the town, and like, and you played Hollywood Hit over this. Yeah. And I was like, what in the holy, un- unholy hell is going on right now? And I was just, I was laughing myself until, yeah, that's what it was. So yeah, we proceeded to chase. What was it? Chase whiskey it's, with, with Patron. Patron. Yeah, and then a Jaeger bomb. And then we did a Jaeger bomb on top of that. The the unholy trinity. And then you leapt over the bar because you were about to drop heavy on top of the bartender and yelled at her saying, "I'll pay for this," and grabbed the can of Red Bull and then just ham boned it down. <laughs> and I was like, "You okay?" And you're like, "I don't know. I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. Wait, I'm okay. I'm okay." I'm okay. I'm okay. Then I would ask, I'm like, I'm leaving. I want to decide to go smoke a cigarette. And I came back in, and you're kind of sitting down trying to gain your bearings still. I'm like, all right, we're never doing that again. No, we're never doing that again. We're never doing that again. No. That night ended with me carrying you out after you'd thrown a, an we, – we, I don't remember getting – I don't remember being asked to leave. 
w- well, we as a group, <laughs> after you threw a, for whatever reason, you picked up our empty bottle and launched it across VIP. Yeah. And I turned around to the bouncer. I was like, we're going to eat our check. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and I drove up there, but Revan was sober, so he drove us back. Yeah. I think I was because you guys put me. I was in my Jeep. I had my Jeep Cherokee at the time, and you guys put me in the in like the trunk space because we gave you a burger and put you in the trunk. Yeah, and then backseat Nick and you were passed out in like the shit and shotgun, and he was in the backseat. Was, it was yeah, in the passing the backseat. That's how we. That's how you ended up with yeah. the name backseat Nick. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was uh, it was one of those shots. And I woke up in Milwaukee. We uh. Like you guys were complaining, you're like this double Nick thing. We got to figure something yeah. out. Yeah, and then I was like, well, obviously Chicago Nick, and I was like, well, fuck it, you're in the backseat, backseat Nick. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so okay, that whole thing came from the Highbury. So my first time there, I was working at Devon in Glendale at the time, and I was also working part time at Trocadero. Like one time a week on Sundays, I was like literally a ticket monkey. I sat in the well and I just made Bloody Marys for like three hours and made like $150. It was the easiest money ever. I did every Sunday. Mm-hmm. And the owner, we were talking football one time and he goes, hey, you should go check out this place it's called the Highbury. And I was like, is that an Arsenal bar? He goes, yeah, but they play all the matches there. I go, cool, check it out. So me and my friend Lindsay at the time, not Lindsay, you know, this is a different friend, Lindsay. Mm-hmm. Um, that I know from college. I lived up here at the time. Uh, her and I went up there and I'm wearing my Ronaldo jersey and I have a scarf on my neck. And she had bought a T-shirt at Stefan's or something like that. We walk in. It was Liverpool United. And when I tell you the first floor was packed. I'm talking World Cup level packed of Liverpool fans. So immediately I'm like, my boss was just fucking with me. Like he went to see something in the lines then. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God. And I go to the corner of the bar and like, I'll, take, I'll take two mirror lights. And I look at my friend and um, she's like, Get the fuck out of here. I'm get my ass kicked in a second. I was about 40 pounds lighter at the time. I don't know what I was doing. Wes and Ike are on the second level of the pub. They sit me. They go, hey, you. Hey, you. I just eventually I turn over. And they go. And I go up and they go, you wear that. You hang out with us. So then it was like him. Wes, it was Wes, Ike, Michael Jackson. Not not that Michael Jackson. Yeah. Big, giant, white, Big Michael Jackson. Guy, yeah. DJ from Racine, who's the coolest dude ever, by the way. I haven't seen him in forever. Yeah, dude. that guy's wild. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, he's, he's a funny dude. Uh, Scottish Pete, Stormer, Polish Rob, uh, Carol, all of them were there. And that's kind of what, that was like the original gang. And the name thing came from, because there was a Nick with the beard, the bearded guy, from who's an Arsenal supporter. Mm-hmm. So he was Arsenal Nick. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then so I had to be Chicago Nick. And then there was a couple other Pete's, and there was there was a, there was a, I don't even met him. There was the guy who like literally his name was Pete Blackburn. So everyone called him Blackburn Pete because he supported Blackburn because that was his last name. Yeah. Um. And then Wes was just Wes, Ike was just Ike because they're very unique names. Same with Stormer. Yeah. But there were like nine Robs. So Rob was Polish, Polish Rob. Rob, and then and then Scottish Pete, and then there's Chicago Nick, and then Carl was is crazy. So he was crazy Carl, Arsenal Carl, or as I called him, Hot Carl. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> And that's yeah, so, so that's how the name started building. Like, yeah. I got, I, 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 I remember um, Pete was talking about going to um, West Ham Jason's wedding. And he goes, I'm going to Jason. And I follow him on Instagram. He follows me. I feel bad, Jason. I'm sorry if you listen to this. I don't, remember, I don't know his last name. And he told me his Jason, his last name. He's going to his wedding. I go, I don't know the guy. He goes, You've known him for five years. I go, I don't know the guy. He goes, West Ham. I go, Why don't you tell him his name was West Ham? I only referred to him as West Ham for like five years. <laughs> so I had no clue who this guy's name was. So the, the, that was the entire, was the impetus of that was like, we had so many just basic white guy names Nick, John, Bob, Rob, and like Rick mm-hmm. that everyone had to be denoted by either where they were from, what color their skin was, what their nationality was, the city they're from, who they supported. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure there was like a gay mic and a straight mic at some point in time and everything else in between. And everyone like, adopted these monikers because it's how everyone knew each other. It's how the kind of the family rolled. I was telling the story the other, uh, this was actually yesterday. Um, Chris's fiance had asked about it. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people don't know that like Parker is my last name. And yeah. all, all that stemmed from was from playing sports. There was a crane. There was, there was a Wojo. So finally, like one day after like 10 mics, like turned around or, or Michael's turned around, Coach finally snaps. He's like, God damn it. He's like, you're Parker. You're Wojo. You're Crane. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, I'm sick of fucking screaming at you kids. And 10 of your heads turn around. Blah, blah, blah. And we're just like, okay. But because of the fact that we all referred to each other as that, 
that's how like that's how we all referred to each other. Yeah. It was like Crane and so on and so forth. So even when I introduced myself to people, everyone was always like, why does those guys always call you Parker? I was like, oh, we, we wrestle or we play football yeah. together. Our coaches all call us by our last names. And we always just did that. So we just always called each other by our last names yeah. or or we had a nickname or, you know, it was based on ethnicity where we would all just jokingly yeah. just openly harass each other about, oh, yeah. about either being Mexican, whatever. Polish, German, whatever the hell it was. We just constantly harassed each other on it. And then... uh. And then, yeah, I, I just got sick of trying to explain to people why everyone called me Parker. I just was like, fuck it. Hey, I'm Parker. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Instead of being like, hey, these people call me by my first name. These people call me by my last name. It's at the point now my parents, my mom is like, Parker. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, it's whatever. I don't give a shit anymore. Call me whatever the fuck you want. Call me Zero Cool. Call me Parker. Whatever. Just don't call me late for shots, motherfucker. No, I'm yeah, kidding. Yeah, right. Uh, shit, what else was there? Oh, I remember what I was going to say, the karaoke thing. Yeah, dude, that was a, that was a $50, I literally walked up to him, gave him 50 bucks, and was like, please turn this girl's, girl's, girl's song yeah. off. And then the guy started complaining, and the DJ goes, you got 50 bucks? He goes, no. He goes, well, the song's turning off then. You I was like, turned it off. I was like, please delete this from your fucking library. We had, did, we did the math that night at the bar, and we had figured out at that point in my life, between DJing three to four nights a week for Silk, that I had listened to Motley Crue's Girls, Girls, Girls collectively around 30,000 times. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I don't ever want to hear this fucking song again. Even when it comes on on the radio, I immediately turn it off. As you should. Um, oddly enough, it was based on a Tampa strip club. That whole video and shit like that where yeah. it says live nudes, that place is still around. It was like a nude strip club down in Florida, it doesn't down shock Tampa. Me. It doesn't shock me. Yeah. It's Florida. And then Motley Crue, <laughs> Motley Crue was fucking partying there, and they're like, we're going to make a song about this place. Hence, girls, girls, girls. I think that's what the name of the place was, was girls, girls, girls. Big neon sign. I hope, you get, I hope the owner got a cut of that. He probably did. Well, I mean, hell, he got the shit filmed at his fucking yeah. at his strip club, so Good I point. probably put it on the map. <laughs> well, damn, dude. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to bring up. We are talking about the fact that you opened up your gym. Congratulations yeah. about that. <laughs> did you get a chance to open that bottle yet? Uh, so that was actually going to happen. Uh, my girlfriend and I... Uh, I was all wine two stories into that one. So there's a company called Strong First. Um, mm -hmm. They specialize in kettlebell, body, body, barbell, uh, strength, and uh, body weight athletics. And uh, they have a level one, level two certification. Her and I were going for level two. Um, and they have a couple things. They have like a couple movements that are based on body weight. Now, I trained, dedicated this for about three months, and I wasn't sure if I can actually hit the weights that I required to do it. So I weighed in about 219, but thought a week to, a week out of it. And I was able to press the weight that I needed to right below that weight. So I didn't know if I could actually get the weight I needed to if I was over 203 pounds. So like in four days, we talked about this. I cut down to 200 pounds, mm -hmm. nailed all my weights, no problem. So uh, we were going to open the bottle that night. Um, because we both, Amanda just, she just, she destroyed it. I mean, talking like people were looking at her like, do you want to use both arms for that single arm press? Cause <laughs> the right side was good. And we use the left side now. Cause she, she absolutely destroyed it. She's super, super strong. And it's I'm very, very impressed. She works very, very hard at it. And, um, so she did great. We actually opened the, opened the bottle that night. We got home and we, at that point in time, we had been there for 10 hours and we just passed right the fuck out. Oh, okay. So, but yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was very, very kind of, you happen to know my, my favorite champagne. That sounds kind of weird to say to somebody, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, that was a, I did not see that coming at all. Um, last March when we shut down for everything, I was at, at the time I was working for a corporate gym and uh, I was actually on track. To have the biggest month of my career, I was on track for like 190 sessions, mm -hmm. which would have exploded my previous total by, by like 50 sessions that month. And obviously, we got shut down March 14th, I think was the day we locked down, and that was the wayside. The summer was, honestly, my, my company never did me wrong at that point in time. They were still paying us for a little time, and then there were some financial issues where they refused to pay, refused to pay me for five bon sorry, four bonuses that I earned previous to them locking me down. There are bonuses that are paid out quarterly. I'm not getting to the semantics of it all, but uh, they refused to pay me for money that took me about four to five years to earn. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, I've never complained about 
I mean, I work seven days a week on purpose because I don't mind working. I love what I do, thankfully. Um, and we never complain about working extra, showing up to meetings, teaching classes. It never bothered me. But if I work for you and you don't pay me for my job, we have a real, real big problem. And there's no backing down for me on that one. That's the one. That's the hill I'm going to die on, mm-hmm. as the saying goes. And that was it. And I told my boss, I said, you know what? You guys have been overly generous for me the first three months of this. And now we're about to open, we're opening up again. And you're refusing to pay me this money that I've earned. Some of these bonuses took me three years to earn. Not a week. I understand if I could pay me that. This this took from 2017, which has nothing to do with COVID or anything else. They said, we're still kind of waiting to see back, blah, blah, blah. And they refused to pay me, so I quit. Uh, in the middle of a pandemic, no less. Yeah. Um, and then at the time, I just, you know, um, I had some clients that were never members of the company that I worked for. They, they had a non-compete there. So I could if I left the company, I couldn't train members of the company. Rightfully mm-hmm. so, I understand that. That's kind of like going to a place, taking all the employees and making your own place. It's, it's, it's not a cool thing to do. So I had some clients on the side that never, ever were members of them. So they kind of kept me afloat at the time. I was doing a lot of day trading on my own, my own portfolio for a bit to make money. And um, I had a client at the time who was does, who I still do, thankfully, who was doing commercial real estate, or does, that's what he does for a living, found me a place. Um, in the summertime, I started a, a just slowly during that, like the big empty shelf rush of the gym. If only no one no, 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 who tried to buy gym equipment last summer, you couldn't find it anywhere. No one no. had it. And I was able to slowly accrue things, you know, one dumbbell at a time, one kettlebell at a time, one bench at a time. Found a place, um, you know, and I only I hired a guy to change the lighting and install some hardware that if someone fell off a pull-up bar off a ceiling, I don't want to be liable for that. Mm-hmm. Other than that, <laughs> uh, Amanda and I, my sister, and her boyfriend uh, painted the whole place. Um, we put in the whole flooring, um, decorated everything else myself, and then we officially opened uh, March 1st. That was my six months plus two weeks from when I quit my last job. And I was basically free and clear of any kind of legal issues. Um, I was able to work as freely as I wanted to. I, I stayed within the law because I did pay a lawyer bill for negotiating my lease. And the fact that some bitch took me for 200 bucks to send an email, I went ahead and kept my mouth shut and did not do anything illegal in those times where I was in limbo for my last company. Yeah, um, I want to make sure everything was above board for that. And uh, yeah, so basically during the pandemic, I quit my job and just been working for myself. It's... Uh, Number one, my dog's with me at all times. I named the place after my dog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's uh, it's kind of cool. Just, you know, I, again, work every day, seven days a week. But, uh, yeah, it's um, it's it's a very – it's it wasn't scary to the point where, I, like, I was betting on myself or some sort of cliche you're going to think of in that term. But it was uh, liberating in a scary sense, meaning I have no one to report to. But then it's like, oh, shit, I have no one to report to. Like, no one has my back. Mm-hmm. I know I, I have a very a very tight support structure, and they'll do anything for me. I understand that. But when it comes down to it, like, my, it's my name in the business, my name in the LLC, my name on the lease. It's it's down to me at the end of that, the end of the day there. So that's kind of, like, scary and also, you know, comforting, saying, like, okay, cool, you, you failed this? Okay, it's you. Mm-hmm. No one else told you you weren't good enough. No one else told you you couldn't handle this. It was just you. Let's do this. Yeah. And so far, it's like, you know, it's been a good three, four months so far. And we'll see. And I have a five-year lease, so hopefully I'll make, I'll make it through that. So you know? so now with you having your own gym now, is Amanda training out of there as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So what is, like, for example, give me what your sales pitch to a person like me would be. Like, my background is jujitsu, boxing, kickboxing. What What's the direction you're going to push me to do to improve already what I have a base on, like to improve my conditioning, Mm -hmm. my cardio, uh, keep my weight down. What's something that you would advise for someone like me? So two ways to answer that question. Number one is I'll be completely honest is that like, I don't have a lot of athletes that I train. I have a lot of former athletes that I train people that had like, there are some, some clients are trying to relive their glory days from high school. Some are trying to look like the way they did in high school or college and what it may be. Um, and I think that's one of the interesting ways I'm like, if you met my clientele, it's a very much a motley crew of people mm-hmm. ranging from 24 to 73. It's very, very diverse. And I think a lot of things that I'm not going to generalize, but anybody or nor am I going to, you know, poo poo anybody's business or how they, how they train people, um, is that 
it takes a, a different kind of trainer that is able to get out of their own way. Um, I have more certifications you can put on this wall and that wall, and that and really, and that doesn't mean shit. Um, and by that, by that I mean, if I can't take what you want to do and form it in a way that's going to be beneficial to both of us, I'm not doing my job properly. I've had a lot of clients come to me and complain about previous trainers saying that, I, you know, I told them I had an injury once. So immediately that trainer took that injury as like, oh shit, I can't do anything with him or her until this one tiny thing is fixed. And so the next 10 weeks of their sessions are going to be just PT. Mm-hmm. And they get bored and leave. These people are mothers, daughters, fathers, sons, professionals, retirees. They want to look good, naked, essentially, at the end of the day, really what it is. And they want to feel healthy and feel better, especially now. So when someone comes to me, like, like you said, for someone like an athletic-wise, cool. What's your short-term goal? What's your long-term goal? Do we have time on these things? Do you have a fight coming up? Do you want to just stay in fight-ready shape? Is this a profession for you? Is this a basic thing for you? What injuries have you had in the past? What injuries have you had currently? What's what? What do you have any niggles? You have like a shoulder niggle, like your elbow hurts, your wrist, your neck, blah blah blah. So, but the way you want to take this down is okay, cool. Do we need to improve how you fight? Absolutely not. That's your method. It's like if I have a baseball player, I'm not gonna work on his goddamn swing. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna work his rotational power, how he plants himself, and how he stabilizes his body. If I have a football player, am I going to tell him how to, how to catch a ball, or throw a ball, or smash someone's head in? Absolutely not. We're going to work on his cleans, on his jerks, on his, on his snatches to get him vertical power. And because he works in an explosive environment, 10 seconds or less, that's his universe. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So now a fighter, mixed martial arts, if you will, in any, or in any kind of mode of fighter. What are we working on? Well, muscle groups help with punching power. What works with the hips? What works with flexibility how can we maintain these these modalities and still have you excel perfect we have a 10-week camp coming up money let's plan that out to where you're going to peak eight or nine weeks in deload you down save energy up and get you ready for fight week so someone comes to me with this conversation saying hey i want to get better at fighting awesome you're a professional fighter no i'm not great is this more of a hobby for you fantastic cool what do you do for your living i work at t-mobile Awesome. Okay. So you're not going to be in here five times a week. Yeah. I'll see you twice a week and we'll go from there. But I want to get better at Muay Thai. Fantastic. What, 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 what does Muay Thai mean? Muay Thai means clinch work. Muay Thai means flexibility. You need high knees. You need fast elbows. So we work on fast switch programs. We work on speed. We work on endurance. We work on explosivity, building off the hips and going from there. So it's not so much of a sales pitch. It's that I have someone come in. I'll do a movement assessment for them and then we'll do a session based on what our conversation about their goals are and what they see in their movement assessment assessment. They might come in and say, Hey, I want to do all these things you just told me. And I see you try to balance on one leg and it looks like a piece of grass in a windstorm. We're not going to be doing much else for the first day or so other than harnessing what we have because we never want to build a building on sand. Want to make sure you have everything what you have is stable, keep you safe, having fun, and coming back for more sessions. Mm-hmm. Not because I want more money, because I want to see you succeed. So when it comes to whatever comes to the door, it's a matter of not only just reading the person, but coming to mutual agreement saying, at the end of the day, you can do what I want to tell you, or you, do, you don't have to do what I'm telling you. What I'm saying is that if we follow this together, we have mutual trust involved here, we'll get to a place where I promise you, actually, I shouldn't say I should promise. I hope that one day, if you're dedicated to this, we, we won't have to ever ask for another session because you always want to keep coming back. For yeah. And that's all it really is. It's a matter of just of, of coming to a mutual understanding of saying, how can we get better at your activities of daily living? If your activities of daily living it consists of walking the dog, taking out the groceries, and playing with your grandkids without any pain, let's get you there. If your activities of daily living mean I need to come in here once a day because I have jiu-jitsu in the morning and kickboxing at night, Cool. Let's frame the, your strength and conditioning around those things to get you better at those. Mm-hmm. But in the gym, you never work on your fighting. You never work on your baseball or your basketball. You work on skills that get you better at that sport. So that's kind of where it is. It's like everyone's like, you want people to do like punching drills with bands. Can that shit. They, they, they learn how to punch there. That's, that's punch land. Yeah. Here is deadlifts and speed. Here's trap bar deadlifts and, and explosivity. That's, that's what you work on in the gym. I like that. That's an that's a unique outlook. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. You don't want to be doing uh, you don't want to do shadow boxing with with bands no. in the gym. You want to do that 
you want to do that on the mat somewhere else. That makes a lot of sense. I like that. That's in Fightland. Yeah. That's not in that's not in, in my on my Olympic platform. We're not gonna be doing sprawl drills <laughs> and uh yeah, and, and up downs. That's that's not how that works. Yeah. I like that, man. I like that a lot. Now for philosophy, is that something that you developed over time or is that taught to you, or is that like from talking to other guys? Like how'd you come about with that? Honestly, it gets I've been doing this now for a little over a decade now, and I walked in, you know ass backwards figuring out what the hell I want to do with life and I kind of fell into this gig and it just had just so happened that I kind of found my muse um and I've always had I don't have a degree in the field I have a degree in economics um but I've always been interested in fitness and I kind of just fell in this this position to a point at an interview um and it took me a while because I heard terms my first week in the job I was like what is that a bicep? I don't know what the fuck that is. And so I took that as like, cool. Half my coworkers have degrees in kinesiology and movement science. I don't have any of this shit. So I took it upon myself to just turn to like a sponge, take every class, invest tens of thousands of dollars in my own education. And I took people after me because I went to CrossFit. I became a level one trainer. People after me, I became a level two trainer for CrossFit. And then I went to the exact opposite of that to the USA weightlifting program. I went to level one, then went to level two, and then went to strong first, learned about kettlebells. And then I went to a pre and postnatal class. It was me and 15 women, one other guy, to, to train women who are pre and postnatal. Yeah. And then I, you know, I went to um, something with trigger point for massage therapy and something to training barefoot stuff. And then it's just kind of like putting everything in a hopper and seeing kind of like what I want in there to kind of come to the bottom. And, and the gym I worked at, mind you, yes, it was a high income alpha kind of scenario, but there was a lot of diversity when it came to the clientele and they would send you, your boss would kind of send you, okay, this person wants to do X. They kind of knew who specialized in that. The thing was, I didn't really have a specialty. People worked hard for me. Mm-hmm. So people wanted to work hard and get their quote unquote ass kicked. I don't know why that was like, I became that guy, but whatever. Um, that's not really how I operate ever. There's times for that, you know, where's you know, like like I had a client today who was kind of surprised that we ended early. I was like, your warrior program's done today. We're done. But I don't want to go more. We're done today. Cause they're and two days from now, we're testing the one at max deadlift. We're, we're done today. Yeah. It's a, you don't have to walk out of here wringing your shirt out of sweat. We're building you for a certain for, for a certain situation that's where we're going from. So that philosophy really developed from just, you know, just a, literally a decade now, a little over a decade of just teaching so many people and like meaning so many is that it turned on to like, yeah, I want them all to be able to do X. Yeah. I want them all to be able to do Y, but if they don't want to do that. What's the point? Yeah. And end up being more of like, how can I best serve this person by giving them what they want, but subtly putting in what they need without them even knowing it. Like if they have bad hips, great. I understand that. Don't focus on the hip for 37 sessions in a row. They say, the, 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 they say, I want to come in. I want a bigger ass. I want bigger biceps. Give them that. Mm-hmm. That's the goal. But if you can also put in their warm up somewhere in the workout, you know that they need stronger feet because they can't plant when they press. Build that in while still making them go towards their goal. You never lose a client. Yeah. I dig that, man. Now, but- crazy. Like, Going back to what you said before, you have a degree in economics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, I personally know you. Do you want to do you want to explain college at Purdue and for yourself, and kind of take us through like why you were in such great shape, why you had an interest in fitness? Yeah. Um. I have a uh, some people like 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 my much better looking, much smarter, much more talented half. I shout uh, out to Andrea. Yeah, that's my sister, that jackass, Amanda. Uh, Amanda, sorry. <laughs> wow. Uh, um, I have a genetic uh, dog food pile. It's not pretty. Um, I come from a long line of uh, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, and uh, smokers and drinkers. Um, and uh, smoker for myself about 10 years. Um, I think the turn- one of the turning points was uh, – it, I lost my mom at 19, but that wasn't was an issue about it. My dad was a drinker for a long time, smoked his whole life, 
you know, the uh, bypass zipper scar. Mm -hmm. His father, same thing. His twin, late twin brother, the same thing. Um, and it's was very much a shift personally to take advantage of what I could do in that I never wanted to have an excuse for not being fit for something in that I wanted to experience more, do more, et cetera. How that fell into fitness was I was working at a bank. It wasn't a dead end job by any stretch of imagination. It was actually it was a very good stepping stone for a job. I just didn't apply myself at all. I'm not going to be lying to you. I showed up, just checked out. I did, I did, I did barely the bare minimum, mm -hmm. honestly. And I'm surprised it kept me on as long as it did. Um, and I went to a job interview at a fitness facility and they asked me what was going on. How's my, how does my, you know, experience fit into this? And I was like, yeah, you know, I've been doing Spartan races for about five years. Same with Tough Mudders on my friends that I've been training them to do that as well. And it came down to, and it really has nothing to do. I don't really care how I look at how, whatever it is. It really is just that like, I see when I'm walking, even here, when I was walking here or when I'm driving, whatever, I see examples of people who are probably in their 60s, maybe 50s, can't walk, need walkers, need help. And my biggest fear, besides like drowning in like rats, <laughs> is being physically trapped on my own body. I don't know if I have the mental fortitude to handle that. Meaning if I can sit like this with my hands on the table and I can't pick up my fingers like this, I'd be just petrified. It'd be ineffable. I could not explain to you what kind of fear that puts into me. And I think that kind of built into physical fitness and all it really is at the end of the day, it's still a hedge for health because any of the genetic tests, the 23 meal other shit that I found, I have a predisposition for two things, macular degeneration. I'm blind essentially and cancer. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like not if, but when, which is terrifying to think of, but what can I do to hedge that, to push it back? If not off the ledge, it's being fit, eating well, taking a vitamin regimen for God knows how long, for 10 years I've been doing this. And so to kind of bring it full circle to now, I was probably amongst the least concerned last year when this pandemic hit. Um, I am not in a high risk area. I am not overweight. Um, I am not of the older gender. I'm not above 55 or 60. I do not have any poor health habits. I occasionally drink. Rarely to excess anymore, honestly. I just don't have time because I wake up before in the morning to go to work every day. So I just so I don't have the time, honestly. We, we don't have the time to uh, do all-nighters and not, wake up to yeah, watch United play. We don't. <laughs> to pass out of my truck and have Joe <laughs> press the alarm button because those who don't know it in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, if you drive your if you pass on your car drunk with your keys in the car, you can get a DUI for that. Mm -hmm. Um and but what you would used to do is drive to the pub or park at the pub and walk back to our cars that are going to the going to the bars all night, put our keys down the mail slot at the highbury, and Joe would hit the alarm clock in the morning to wake you up. Yeah. So yeah, those days are kind of long gone. So I didn't. I, I basically by doing what I what I've done, just keep myself in the best condition possible. Um, it was kind of just a hedge. So like I didn't have to worry about. It. I haven't been to the doctor, and besides when I had staff from jujitsu, like. 10 years like and it's, it's basically been broken bones or like like a staph infection from like either sports or skydiving like that was literally yeah. why i got i went to the doctor so anytime i get like i that's why i was actually thinking about talking with like aaron uh lisa to post this about this how like people like myself and i think i had to apply it to herself how we are the medical system as in we don't use it yeah like we're not we're not dependent upon it and that's what I hope people would get to. That's what actually what I hope this past year would get to is people that said, okay, what are the people that are getting sickest? Well, the overweight and the type 2 diabetes. Well, if that wasn't a sign to get your ass in gear, I don't know what is. Yeah. Um, you know, that was that was a hard thing about about this whole COVID thing is that everyone was worried, and, and rightfully so. Oh, yeah. But I remember having a conversation with my mom about this. My mom's, if you don't know my mom, Mama Kel's a nurse. Um and she was she was concerned about me because of the amount of people I'd been around because of being in the bar industry. Yeah, sure. sure. And I had said, I'm the least of anyone's worries. Am I overweight? Meh, maybe on a medical term, but like on a medical scale. But, you know, this is someone that still does jujitsu. Well, I haven't done jujitsu in a while, but I'm doing kickboxing oh, at least three to, three to four, <laughs> three to four days a week. It was, you know, here's the thing, man. There was there was a weird shift in our jujitsu at our gym and I wasn't sure what to do yet because well, Danny left. Yeah. Um. 
and it was one of those that Ben has always been a really Ben and Justin were the two two guys that I have, I've always really worked with. And those were the guys that were kind of leading everything. And I didn't know how everything was going and with Lovato coming there and so on and so forth. And now it's to the point where I'm a little more comfortable. But the problem is, is this, is that I take time away from jujitsu and I'm just full steam into kickboxing. Right. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like I feel really good. I haven't been injured in forever. Like I think the last time I got injured, I, I broke my toe. Uh, shout out to Joe Miller. Yeah. Uh, actually Joe Miller and Skyler. Uh, I broke, I broke my toes on both those guys. <laughs> Um, it was just cause I, I'd kick short. I was, I was going for a quick kick instead of yeah. like, instead of a power kick. And I just, I just threw it up and I think I kicked a knee. Yeah. Happens. Anyway. Um, those were the last time I got injured, but I'll take time away from jujitsu. And then I go back and like, I remember I was rolling with, uh, Luis junior. I was, I was rolling with cool whip and I was framing out and he moved wrong. And I just, we were both rolling. He goes, was that your arm? And I just heard a pop. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I don't know what that was. Let's get up. And he was just like, S- totally sorry about it. And it wasn't like we were trying to kill each other. No, he's, no, no. He's a purple belt I've known for, 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 I think him and I have been rolling together since it started. And it was just one of those that it was just an accident. And I, I was a little rusty. And it, he didn't mean anything about it. We were just kind of flow rolling and something popped. And I just went, all right, I'm up. And then it's. All right, I'm gonna take a couple of days off, and I would go back to jujitsu again. And so I, someone would catch me with something, and <laughs> it'd be a wrist, it'd be a shoulder, yeah. it'd be this, and we're. It's we're, not if but when. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's now to the point where I get concerned about the fact that of getting injured when I wasn't when I wasn't DJing. Yeah. I didn't really give a shit. Like there was times where like, dude, especially when my grandpa got sick. Like I was there you know, two times a day just because I didn't know what to do. And yep. I was like, all right, I'm going to go in the morning. I did two hours, went and did some shit, hung out my grandpa and my grandma over in hospice, had another gym bag in the car, and then ran back to the gym for right. two or three hours. And it was just one of those. Someone had said something like, you okay? And I'm like, I got some shit I'm working through. But that's always been the place that I, I, I worked <laughs> through it, where it was like, that's what I did. And then when I took time away from jujitsu, that's that's what kind of killed me, is that like your body needs to be conditioned for that. For and sure. it and it just wasn't like I was conditioned just for straight kickboxing, yeah. but um, yeah, I I love all those guys. It's just I took some time away just to see what the hell was going on, and mm-hmm. especially with the new system over there. But the Lovato system over there is pretty good. He's over there at least once a month, and Justin, Ben, um, Amber, who else is is teaching over there? Uh, they're all they're all going down. Uh, Lovato's got his own gym and they go down there. I think if he's not up here, they go down there and pick up new stuff from him and the way it's all set up for them. It's perfect. And there's, there's some really interesting shit that like Lovato brought up, like, especially with using Gein shit like that, where he had shown this, this technique where your arms are up and he goes, what you do is, is when you're in full mount, you scoot up and you put your chest right into their face and he goes, and you lock the arms Yeah, and he goes, you just suffocate them or suffocate him and i was like that can't fucking work and then all of a sudden no, it I, does. I, and i did it but like oh shit <laughs> I was like, yeah, that really does work yeah. i was like god oh, damn it's going um but yeah there's a lot there's a lot of sneaky shit that he teaches and i was like all right i have a lot of respect for it but it, i mean it was one of those two where like i just i've had so much time in and i'm just like i, I don't know, i've done jujitsu now for eight years and i've i've always been more of a striker than anything i loved wrestling yeah it's just one of those that I like it because of the fact I can control if something ever comes up. Like I had an issue a couple of months back where I had to throw someone out of a, I was literally across the street at Taylor's and the guys from Belmont came over and grabbed me and they're like, can you toss this guy out for us? <laughs> and that street has got bad, bad juju for you. Oh, I, I'm not as bad as like any of the other streets in the city. Actually, yeah, <laughs> no, I take that back. I've probably waxed more people on Jefferson yeah. than I have on water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I give that a, yeah, a little bit more. Yeah. The, uh, the right before I left for um, right before I left for Vegas, where the dude tried going after Cushman, and I just laid him out. And I was just like, I was like, you're not gonna do that, bro. I was like, just go home. I just remember uh, I got a text from Ashley about that, and she's like, sweet uppercut, that guy's getting arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Um, what else was I gonna bring? Dude, you know, I remember back to the time. This had to be. Was this 2010, 2011? 
I I brought I had to write a bio the other day and I'd I'd written it as one of my credentials that I once led a group of 150 people into Soldier Field with a group of friends cheering on United versus uh, the Chicago Fire. Oh man, that was that parking lot alone was legendary. Yeah, um, we were probably we were only at like a five minute walk from Soldier Field. About that, yeah, we, we were in the upper deck of the parking lot of Columbus, yeah. yeah. Um. And it was it was me, you, Scottish Pete, who we who we talked about before, Brandon, Cassie, uh, who's been on the the podcast a couple of different times, and a number of other United fans. Everyone was there. I, Stormer, uh, Pete's ex wife was there. Leah, yeah. Um, uh, the guy, I think it was West Mooney. Oh uh, yeah, I think his name was Nick. He was the chef. He brought that like that slab of like salmon. To put oh on yeah, the that's right. Him and his wife were there. Uh, and then people kind of like happened to know from Milwaukee just happened to show up. Like, well, sure, come on over. Yeah, we had. Oh, I think we put down a case of Coors on the way down there. He did. <laughs> it, we we met at that parking lot by Steinhoffels. Yeah. Going south of 94. Ryan Road, yeah. And we all got into my truck and somebody else's. Oh, and, yeah. We piled into my Cadillac. Yeah and, your- Pete, yeah, and Pete sat in the back with Stormer and Leah sat shotgun. And someone else sat in the middle. I had no idea. And Leah and I were talking the entire time. At the time, Pete or had six beers before he got there, like six in the morning. He plowed through the case before we hit the parking lot in Chicago. That began the day. And the, by the end of the night, I think we actually went to Giordano's out in Rosemont for some fucking reason. Why we went on that one, I have absolutely no idea. But Pete wanted to fight two guys on the stands because he wanted to get Paul Scholes' autograph. I'm like, <laughs> what is going on here? It, 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 just, it just got weird. But, yeah, like we all left together. And somehow we were walking in. And, like, the United fans, we, we all kind of, like, walked together. It was weird because we all got tickets from somebody and we sat in the supporter section with fans from England. Yeah. That was we we sat in the end zone opposite the fire fans. That was the weird part was because we happened to sit with them. And so we all ended up walking in together. It was totally random because our ticket said gate, whatever, gate 10, whatever it is. And then that happened to be this section. We walked right up and walked right into our seats. So we all walked in together. It was really weird. Yeah, it was amazing. Like we had walked away. We had walked and it was crazy. We kind of all looked at each other and was like, all right, everyone grab a beer or two. We're going to walk into the stadium, yeah, yeah. start locking everything up. And like we had played, we were playing soccer out in the parking lot and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, there was pop goals. Yeah, and sure. uh, all those guys had like put everything away and they're like, oh, you guys are walking. We'll walk in with you. And then we're all singing and chanting going into the stadium. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, like you, you're like, Parker, I look back and there's like 200 people behind us. And I'm like, are we leading the charge? Like, <laughs> Like, I really wish that, like, I had a better cell phone at the time. I think I had, like, a BlackBerry, and it was just one of those that, like, trying to film it. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. And I was just like, fuck, dude, I wish I had footage of that because it was just absolutely amazing. Then we're inside Soldier Field, and we're singing the entire way, and then we all, like, everyone went one direction, and then Mike Mike Jackson and I, Wes Mooney, and a couple other guys, we were sitting, we were sitting in the end zone, but we were sitting in the or we're sitting in the end zone. Yeah, you weren't with us. Yeah, we were on the opposite side where all the goals were. Yeah. So it was 4-1? Four, 4-1-3-1, four, one? Four, one, one, yeah. Yeah. The so, Fires scored first, and then United was like, okay, not no fucking around, yeah. And then United scored four goals in the second half. Yeah. So the side that Chicago scored on, we saw that in the first half, and then the second half, United scored every goal in front yeah. of us. And Nani that was, had that goal. Nani, he did yeah. a backflip, yeah. Nani was oh, unfucking believable back then, too. Um. Yeah, dude, that was an absolute blast. I actually wrote that. Like, I wrote that into yeah. the, the bio for the, the Spotify thing. Speaking of which, I, I haven't even fucking mentioned it. If you're listening to this or watching this on YouTube and you don't want to watch this and you want to download it, you can go on to Spotify now. Uh, you look up the Zero Cool Podcast. All the episodes are up. Uh, there are some audio issues from uh, the beginning where Randon and I were trying to figure everything out. If you're on Apple Podcasts and you want to download it through there, we are also available through there as well. Um, I think we're like a couple of hits away already from like getting monetiz- monetization from uh, from <laughs> Spotify. And then like I think I'm like another 30 hours away from... Uh, actually, I should be able to hit pretty soon. I'm like another 30 hours away from like YouTube being able Meet to. The so, well, hopefully you can start paying for this fucking gear, dude. <laughs> I just I just bought another camera. Uh, what else did I pick up? It's never ending. Yeah, and then it's, I, it's, 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 it's always, always a better hammer. Yeah, and then there's some wall mounts that I bought for for these cameras over yeah. here. So these are going to come up off the table um, and off Rand- your headboard. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and Randy and I we're, we're going to mount these 
but I'm bum. Uh, mount these on the wall somewhere, and then I'm gonna put up the the artwork finally once I I put up cool. where I'm. I'm putting the cameras and stuff like that. So um, for those of you who are listening in Brussels, for whatever fucking reason, I had like 100 downloads this week over there. Thank you. I don't know why yeah. you're listening, but thanks for thanks and for thank tuning you in. for kicking the shit out of those Russian commie pinko bastards. <laughs> Did you hear that shit? What happened with Ukraine with that? No. Oh, my. So number one, Ukraine is like the redheaded stepchild of, of, of Europe. I know that. Today they yeah. had an unbelievable match with the, with the Danish. They lost the, the, with the Dutch. They lost by one, but it was could on either way. It was a great match. Mm-hmm. So Russia, quote unquote, annexed Crimea in 2014. Uh, the new Ukraine kits for this for the Euro tournament. It looks just like this, but has like an outline of the uh, of like it's kind of have, have like an outline of the borders of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. It includes Crimea. Crimea. Wait, was that the so was that the split between? Uh, East West Ukraine, where it was like part of it was. There's still to- a war going on in, in, okay. in, in, uh, in uh, Eastern Ukraine, but this but this is just the map. Okay, the Crimean Peninsula is the pure south of Ukraine. It's six, six, six out in the Black Sea. Russia annexed that as part of Russia, so Ukraine put that as part of like literally. It's like an outline. It literally is. It's like a kid took like like a like a pin and like a dot outline of the of the country. Put it on the back of it. You can barely see it. Russia files a formal complaint with UEFA. About Ukraine's jerseys having Crimea on there, Ukraine tells them to go fuck themselves essentially. And on the inside, underneath the badge, you can't even see it. Like here mm-hmm. on their shirt, it says "Slava Ukraini, Heroim Slava." That means "Glory be to Ukraine, glory be to the heroes." It's a reference to those who fought for Ukrainian independence. One of them being my grandfather, World War II, fucking savage demon men who blew up trains that the Russians don't know about. Just, <laughs> added that up. Uh, yeah, my, 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 my grandma's a little rascal. Um, anyways, um, so the compromise was they would remove the stitching of the inner part of their jersey, but they got to keep the outline of the country because Russia complained to UEFA about it. What? Yeah. So thankfully, Belgium beat the shit out of them 3-0. It should have been 4-0. Actually, 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 probably should have been 5. They had a couple lucky slaves, saves in there. Yeah. But yeah, so now Ukraine has adopted as Heroim Slava, glory be to the heroes, as their mantra, as a big middle finger to Russia. <laughs> First of all, Russia's number one in international competition in their history. Ukraine has won several. Yeah. U21 World Cup. The European, they won the European Championship. They actually got a silver medal in the European Championship. So they actually have some stake. And mm-hmm. Russia complained, so they get to change our jerseys? Get bent. Yeah. It's 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 politicking and Putin trying to flex his non muscles, whatever. <laughs> I don't know it's a judoka, but whatever. There was uh there was one other thing I wanted to bring up, um, because I'm slowly running out of material in my head. I think we hit everything in the outline. The last thing I wanted to bring up was there are times and I'm gonna kinda of set this up the best way I can. There are times that I look around the room and I'm completely enamored by the friends that I have. And, and, and the close associations I have with people. Um, and at the same time, I get shocked at the at the stuff that my friends say that they're doing because it's it, it's crazy. My group, my circle of friends just does wild ass shit. Um, <laughs> I, I had the pleasure of of having Callie's mom come and watch the fights with us with with uh, Callie's. Yeah, dad. I was there. And, and you were there with us. And Callie's mom's kind of like. So you're Parker's best friend. Like, what are you? What do you? And you, you start yeah, answering. Yeah. You start answering the questions, <laughs> and it's just one of those where, like, I look over and I'm like, oh, that's right. This is my best friend. Like, it's crazy. You you talk about number one, your extensive gun collection, which was absolutely fucking brilliant. You America. talk about the fact that you've had something like over 300 uh, skydives. No, 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 no. I, I, I need that many to okay. become an instructor. I've only had like twenty-seven. Okay. But yeah, but I, 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 my goal is to one day, if I actually somehow figure out some other parts between jujitsu and work, to get back up in the air. Shout out to Scott at Midwest and with Garrett and uh, uh, um, Kazu out there um, to get back up in the sky. But yeah, I would love to one day be an instructor because it's just, it's the greatest thing. It's, yeah. it's a lot of fun. Anyways, you can, yeah. you can free jump. You don't have to do tandem anymore, right? No, no. I, I did one tandem and then I took the six hour class and I've been jumping solo since. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you were explaining to Callie's mom that you were, you're doing Everest with Amanda. You're yeah, doing that in September, right? We're going for my 40th birthday. We're going to do a 14 uh, day trek up to and back from, uh, uh, not Lhasa. Um, oh, geez, it's from uh, the city outside of wherever Tenzin Norgay Airport is. Um, uh, it's it's a trek from there to the base camp of Everest. So we we fly into Kathmandu, then take a, like a puddle jumper to a landing ship that's on the side of a mountain that literally ends off a mountain. 
just film with it. Follow Everest Base Camp on Instagram, and they're like the plane drops off the side of a mountain and flies away. It's pretty awesome. I've seen, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then from there, uh, it's a fourteen day trek up to Everest Base Camp at seventeen thousand five hundred feet, I think it is, and then back down to that airport, and then that's going to be uh, for my fortieth, hopefully. So yeah. So you're going three miles up, like vertically, yeah, vertically. Okay. Yeah. I will be three miles up. Yeah. Do a uh, do you have to do oxygen for that or no no no, no. that that's above the dust on twenty thousand feet that that's that, that's that's above camp three on on Everest itself and then there's seven camps for Everest right four four okay yeah. so you're stopping short of one. I'm right at base camp I'm literally at the, at the lowest that's where everyone hangs out for like months and that's the like that's where like you you hike up from there to camp one back down to camp two to back down you're basically your base of operations at base camp it's like okay. a big rock field the base of the uh at the base of the uh, Kumbu Icefall okay. Yeah, man, that's absolutely crazy. I'm, yeah. listening, I'm listening to you tell this story, and I'm like, fuck, that's one of my best friends over there. I was like, it's fucking, I'm like, my buddy's going up fucking Everest. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, god damn. But listen, man, um, I wanted to have you on here for, for fuck ever. Uh, number one, just because we've had, we've had an unbelievable friendship oh, yeah. between, uh, like I said, uh, pulling all nighters where you showed up at Taylor's one night when I was DJing uh, to. We're going to stay up all night. We're going to watch uh, United win their 20th trophy. This was 2012, 2013 oh when, they had, God, when yeah. Van Persie was still on the team. That, that, was, that was a rough one. We closed down Taylor's after bar after barred at Taylor's. Yeah, left there. Yeah, we were there for a bit. Came back here. You passed out within five minutes. Not even. <laughs> yeah. Missed burrito, missed burrito night. And then, uh, and then we woke up the next day. Oh, my God. I just remember the other part of this fucking story when we got pulled over. Mr. Parker, due to your extensive... Driving record. Do you really think another ticket will help you at this point? Yeah. I remember you looking over at me and be like, that cop just scolded you for your horrible driving yeah. record. He literally said, because you're a driving record, I don't think another ticket's going to help you out today. And let us go. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you go to a match, wake up earlier. That was his advice. And then he let us go. And knew that we were wasted stuff. Oh, I, we, we smelled of bad decisions in last night. It was horrible. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm leaving that, that one part. Of the I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. And then we, we, I think we left there. That we, was the Brewers, uh, uh Brewers game. That yeah. Was afterwards. Yeah. We left end of the game. We're, we're watching United hoist the trophy and we're like, all right, cool. Someone walks in, hands Joe Katz. I mean, he was in the bathroom. He gave it to us. And we, yeah. and we were like, Hey Joe. Yeah. Someone brought these tickets for you. Do you want them? And he's like, guys can just have them. So we called the girl I was seeing at the time and we're like, come pick us up. And she's like, why? I'm like, because I don't think I can legally drive. No, she's she was like, with us. She took off. She took my car and took off. Oh, okay. And then we were. She drove us the game. Yeah, because we were supposed to either walk back or get a ride back. Cause right. She went to go get her nails done or some shit. Whatever. And then she was just like, okay, I'm picking you guys up. And she's like, you're doing what? I'm like, we're going to the Brewer game. She's like, I'm coming too. And, and, I was and, like, and you, you told her to rage your refrigerator for like, like the 12 Modellos you had left. Dude, we drank a 12-pack of warm Modellos because they were on the floor from yeah. the night before. We drank. She came down with a with a grocery bag yeah, yep, yep. full of Modellos. Yep. And we literally, we had her driving. We shotgunned one of them hmm. before we got into the car. Yes. And then we're drinking the last one as we walked into Miller Park. Yeah. From your house, which is what? Two miles from the stadium? Yeah. From there. And we, we got to the third inning, so the, there was no traffic. We, we literally we drove right, right in. into the parking lot. There was no one there. And from there to there, to the front door, that toll pack was gone. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, yeah. we drank. And then, plus drinking the night before, plus drinking at the Highbury. Yeah. And then... You took me home. I passed out and said we had to go to Silk that night. Yeah, I had to DJ that night yes. still. And then I went there and ordered a vodka soda, and it sat there for half an hour, and I just looked at it like I was like... Because I physically crawled from my bed into the shower because I couldn't stand. And I woke up <laughs> at eight o'clock that night to go to the boat to go to go to the strip club, and that was the night where I broke my rule of never eating in a strip club. And at the afterwards, you're the chef made you like chicken and rice, and they brought out like ten pizzas. And I'm sitting at the bar. I'm like, well, fuck it. And I started eating pizza like at the bar there. And then your buddy, that was the same night where the guy was like a bodybuilder, or whatever, got a shower party with two of the strippers because that was like his going away party. Derek Blake, yeah. Yeah. That was his last night. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Um, that was I, the guy who told me he got so big when he was a bodybuilder, he had to put a bidet in his house because he couldn't wipe his own ass. Yeah, his back got so big that he had a, a bidet installed into his bathroom because he couldn't reach around his arms, and his lats were so big that he couldn't wipe his own ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those, those are my buddies. And it was funny because... so. 
so I always get criti- I, I shouldn't say I get criticized. I get there are comments that are made on a regular basis that that I'm big and like I didn't really realize it till the other day. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Fox Six was filming at Rufus Sport, and I was there. I was doing kickboxing at like six in the morning, some shit like that. And they're there filming, and I didn't really pay any attention to it. I was like, oh, whatever, they're here. Like, mm, no big deal. I just went about my business, whatever. I was curious to just see the footage. And I was like, oh, I wonder if there's any footage of me, like, actually, like, doing my drills and yeah. shit like that. It's not often that, that you're able to see how you look when you're when you're doing drills and stuff sure, like sure. that. Sure, sure. So I went to go look it up, and I'm watching the video, and I'm like, is that me? <laughs> and I'm look I'm looking at the back of me and I'm like my back is ginormous. I never realized how big I was. And it it was because of the fact that I hung out with guys like Derek, uh Brendan Lidkey, uh rest in peace brother. Um Frank the Tank, uh The Neil, all these dudes that were bouncers that were all really good friends of mine. We all went out drinking and I was the small guy of the group. All those yeah. guys were. I remember two, some of those guys. 260, 270, 63, 64. And look, like, I remember Brendo would grab me like a fucking rag doll and pick me up like I was a little kid. And I was probably like a good solid 200, 210 pounds at the time. And you just pick me up like I was a little kid. And I'm like, I'm small. I always thought of myself small because of those guys that yeah. I was around. And then when I'm around normal people i finally realized i was like because i saw myself in comparison to the rest of the people on the mats i was like oh i get it now because like when you perceive yourself you don't perceive yourself as without, what people see yourself without a as doubt, without a doubt and then all of a sudden i saw how big i was and i was like oh, oh this makes a lot of sense without now. a doubt yeah 100 percent understood but yeah uh same thing with like anytime we have a first guy in jiu-jitsu class mind you a i'm currently like i'm from like middle to the higher belts at our school but like any time and my coaches and him and i've had this conversation uh we want to open more schools in the city and he asked me where i see my career in this going and i said i would love to teach one day so we have kind of me doing the instructor program and stuff um but anytime there's a first day guy there's a 99 percent chance and if they're over 175 they're mine yeah and if we're matching up high versus low that day the biggest, tallest, most giant person is coming to me. It's wonderful. Yeah, There's, We have this kid named Quinn. He's easily 260, minimum. Three-stripe white belt. I can barely get my legs around him. And it's like for the first two minutes of the role, you know this, yeah. the new white belts, it's like holding on a bull in a china shop. And once they slow down, it's you know it's 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 T-City time. Um, but uh, Anytime I have something that's like giant in there, some reason I never understood why I got mashed up with them. And of course, you're big. I go, I don't think I am. And people say I am. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't believe you. Whatever. I mean, maybe watch myself on film. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the exact same thing with me. And it's it's goofy because there was a there's a guy that's on the pro team. His name escapes me, but he bounces. Um, he was about 300 pounds at the time, and I think I, I this is right after I had COVID. So it was, I was skinny. I was like 205 at the time. And I looked around the room and I'm like, shit, I'm going to get matched up with this yeah. guy. And we're, and <laughs> that's we're doing, the worst. You see Coach's eyes? Oh, that's the worst. I looked at Gerald and Gerald just kind of shook his head yeah. at me and I was like, God damn it. And I looked at him. I was like, what do you weigh right now? He's like 310. I was like, fuck me. <laughs> and we're doing, we're doing double it. We're doing power doubles that day. Awesome. And I was awesome. like, I was like, I'm about to blow my back out trying to pick this son of a bitch up. I was like, God damn it. But I mean, to, to my credit, I was able to get him up. I was able to do the double. But I was gassed. So by the time that we rolled, oh, yeah. I was just like, I'm just going to hold on to you. No. I'm like, I'm going to try and catch my win from picking you up and drilling the entire yeah, time. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's always been it's always been weird for me um, that, you know, I'm bigger, but like I don't ever see myself as that big. And, yeah. Same. Um, what do you say we call it, man? Cool. You, you want to do a story? Wait, we should do one story before we take off. What's a good one to do that we could close on? Oh geez, the brewer one's just all kinds of wonderful. Um, let's see. No, uh, that's not really a story. It's just like us hanging out and just drinking beers. <laughs> because there's a, just because there's a keeper doesn't mean I'm not going to score. Yeah. Shout no, out to the, shout yeah. to the tall girl in the jean skirt yeah. at Vitucci's back in 2010. God, that was forever ago. Um, we kind of covered like the Tyler of the pub stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
You were you were you were there for the World Cup in 2010 when I did the Captain America costume. No, but I, I saw the pictures yeah. of it. I was that was when Lee Carl Wars fatigues. I wore my Captain America costume. Yeah, that was when Lee opened ten. Yeah, and Cassie had just come back, just came back from L.A., and it was one of those that we wanted to do the hybrid, but at the same time I wanted to show support for Lee. So Cassie and I oh, went sure. there, and we ended up we ended up drinking with all the guys that were uh, Mexican. Mexican League, or uh, I should say Mex- Team Mexico supporters. Yeah. And it was one of those that was top five drunkest I'd ever been in yeah. my life. <laughs> that, like, let me say something to you. Uh, even though I have I've Mexican heritage, like uh, I support the U.S. team, but I'll occasionally watch Mexico, especially after Chicharito got signed to uh, to United. So I was always like, oh, yeah, yeah. watch Chicharito play. I've never drank and played so much dice with with anyone until I watched the game with like the Mexican like followers. And it's just one of those as drink, 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 shot, 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 oh, yeah. drink, drink, drink. I was like, by the end of the 90 minutes, I think I drank like 10 beers and four shots. And I was like, are you fucking for real? <laughs> but yeah, that was the top five drunkest I'd ever been. Um, oh my God. This wasn't really much of like, a, it wasn't, wasn't any kind of, like, any kind of clat- cataclysmic nonsense, but uh, there was one night we decided to go to Trinity and we hung out at Foy's in the end there. For some reason, you knew the guy DJing in like the open, co- like in the, like in the, in like the, the courtyard or something like that. I don't know what happened. But we just ended up just tying one on. And I parked my car in those parking lot streets next to that Water Street Brewery. Mm-hmm. I walked home that night and I didn't have my keys. And you called me the next day. You said you put your keys, you put my keys in my gas tank. I didn't remember giving them to you. And I don't know if you remember doing that, but it was just a random night. I know that's a dumb story, but that was just that was one of those nights. I was like, what the fuck? That was my move back in the day. I never wanted my friends to drive drunk. Yeah. So what I, I would I do is. I walked from the Water Street out to. I lived like a block from Oakland Euros. Yeah. That was the move I used to do back in the day. So I'd be like, if you have your car, I'm like, give me your car. Give me your keys. And be like, okay, what are you going to do with my keys? I'm like, I'll give them back to you tomorrow. And instead of having me to drive back out and <laughs> yeah. give someone their keys, I would just make sure no one was looking. I'd put them like. I'd open the gas tank lid, put the keys in there, close it, and then I would either take a cab, walk home, or I'd continue to after bar, wherever. Yeah. And then whoever called me, I did that to Lee, I did that to Cassidy, I've done that to a ton of friends. Hell, I made Cassidy park his, I made him park his motorcycle on McGillicuddy's patio, <laughs> so he wouldn't drive it home, and I took one of his spark plugs. <laughs> <laughs> Because he was notorious for always trying to ride his bike drunk. And I was like, dude, I'm like, I don't want to be scraping your ass off the fucking freeway. And the same thing goes with my friends. I never wanted any of my friends to ever uh, get into an accident, hurt themselves, hurt these people. So it was always just one of those. I was like, hey, man, if you're not going to take a cab, if you're not going to be responsible, just give me your keys. And I'll, I'll get them back to you. And that was I still did do this to do that to this day. Like last night, Cassie and I went out for a little bit. He was out uh, watching the fights with me. And towards the end, uh, after the fights, we really stopped drinking. And we made our way over to Taylor's, had a couple of waters, ordered a pizza. And I basically was just like, hey, dude, just give me a text. Let me know what you got home safe. Yeah. And he was like, yeah. And I, I I always watch out for my friends. I just, you know, it's one of those that I always get worried the older that we get and stuff like that. It's not so much about us now. It's more that I worry about, like, other people, like, running into them, driving irresponsible sure. and shit like that. So, I mean, hell, I still make Randon fucking text me when he when he goes home after Good. drinking with me. So, But I'm still mad at your old bosses after we went to Etta's. Els in the park for wings. Elsa's. Elsa's. Yeah. We were drinking stories, and somehow you found Stoli Elite. We're drinking Stoli Elite drinks that night. I don't know why. And then we went over to Belmont, met your old boss. I'm still pissed about him taking shots of Campari. I don't know what's in that shit, but it is the devil's weed. It was so horrific. It tastes like hairspray lit on fire. And I'm still mad about that from like eight years ago. That's yeah, that's that's for our. And, and then we went over to a bad genie, and he's like, do a scorpion shot. Like, you can go fuck yourself in your scorpion shot. I'm not eating a scorpion. I'm all set. Was that the night that Green Velvet was playing there and I almost threw that kid off the back patio? Yeah, we could, because we were jammed that back corner of the top bar. I mean, the, the guy kept knocking us in the patio door and you got pissed off at the guy. I, I just told that story the other day. Yeah, that, that kid got his ass kicked twice that night. Yeah, he, I remember so that. I remember, um, I'll, I'll finish on this story. So we we went up to, we were obviously, we were drinking with Ferraro. We were over at Belmont. We were at Elsa's and then we eventually made our way over to Bad Genie to go see uh, uh, Green Velvet. And we were in the back corner. Second and we're, floor. Yeah, the second floor away from everybody. And, oh, yeah, on and, purpose. <laughs> and, and slowly, the place starts getting busier and busier. And we're kind of with a couple of people that is kind of boxing other people out. Yeah. And to the point where um, this kid's next to me and he's elbowing me. And I finally turned around. I was like, hey, dude. I was like, do you know how to say excuse me? He was like, oh, I, <laughs> I, I work here. I don't have to say excuse me. I was like, listen, I go, hmm. if I get another elbow from you. 
I'm going to throw you off that fucking, I'm going to push your head through that fucking door. And I'm going to throw you off the patio. And I turned back around and I'd said something to you. I was like, I'm going to end up killing this kid. And he, and I literally watched your eyes get big because he wound up and hit me in the back with an elbow again. Thank fucking God. This door never opened. I just grabbed him by the shirt. I remember that. Yeah. And I was ragged down him against that door and the push bar went open. So I was like, Fuck it. I can't remember if I headbutted him or if I punched him. I think I headbutted you know, him. It was funny. That's all I remember. <laughs> and I just remember him hitting the ground. I remember Eli taking a that look. That I remember at- for sure. I remember him collapsing like a, just like a, like a, like a Pinocchio. And Eli looks at me and he's just like, Parker, what the fuck? And I was like, all right. Solid point. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Line up a round of shots for everyone. I'll Fair apo- point. Fair I- point. I'm like, I'll apologize to, to everyone and, and buy everyone a round of shots. Please don't throw me out. And I turn around to go help the kid up, and he's already gone. And I had no idea what happened to him. A couple minutes later goes by, and this ginormous bouncer comes up. And I go, I know what this is about. I was like, it's pretty loud up here. I was like, why don't we go out into the patio? I'm like, I can talk to you, and I can tell you what happened. And I was like, maybe you might see my side of the story after I've been drinking all day. I was like, I can totally argue this. So we got into the patio, and I was like, hey, man. I was like, I told this dude to stop elbowing me. I was like, he kept elbowing me in the bar, and I told him if he did it again, I was going to throw him off this patio. And as I'm explaining to the bouncers what's going on, this kid's like, I told you to throw him out. Now, mind you, he was bleeding from somewhere on his face. I don't remember where. And I remember the bouncer turning around and grabbing this kid and just shaking him. Like, (laughs) you don't tell me how to do my fucking job, motherfucker. (laughs) And I remember opening the door and being like, Nick, John, this kid's about to get his ass kicked yeah. again. And like, I look over and Eli's just shaking his head. Super game, stupid prizes. I, I put a hundred on the bar and I was like, I'm sorry, dude, we're just going to leave. Yeah. So as this dude's getting fucking his ass beaten for a second time, we all go down the back stairway of Bad Genie, walk out and walk over to Taylor's, tell Colin what happened and start drinking again. And that was the end. That was, oh, that was right before I left for Vegas. And I yeah, remember- yeah. Yeah, and that was also... Yeah, because that was the night we had dinner at Carnivore. Yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, that was right before I left. That was a crazy-ass night. Oh, but here yeah. you go. I'll, I'll give you the, the short synopsis of my story. I just got it. I just found it. I just found it. Okay. We'll call it. Brewer's Game. You remember it. Don't give me that. Don't don't lie to me. Was that the one that we, we grilled uh, the tacos out in the parking lot? No. This was... Uh, it was... Um, I th- I don't know how a group of six of us kind of merged together. Oh, shit. This one. Okay. We met a... <laughs> We go to the first game, and I took a bus trip up when I lived in Lafayette, Indiana, in college, to the Brewers game for a Cubs Brewers game one time. Don't know why we did it, but I did. We convinced the bartender at Fridays to make me a 32 ounce cup of whiskey coke. That's a, that was the drunkest I've been at Brewers game. This is number two, very close. We somehow find a way into Fridays as we met everybody because we're going to go leave and go somewhere else, go out to party. They closed the outdoor patio to Fridays. You tried paying off an employee there to let us out on the patio for some goddamn reason. You disappear. Gone. And then we're getting kicked out because the game's over. And we have no idea what happens. I'm texting you. I'm calling you. Nothing happens. We're walking back, and you just show up behind me. And <laughs> oh, I was that's like, right. The I was timing like, was just. I was like, what are you doing here? She's like, wait, just what happened? What the hell happened to me? So, yeah. So, yeah. So, I tried to bribe the employee. And so some cop caught wind of what I was doing. And he was like, he said something slick to me where he was, I I, I was so drunk. I don't remember what he said, <laughs> but I was like, I was like, oh, is this place owned by MPD or is this a private property? Or I said something slick like that yeah. back to him. I was like, this ain't your jurisdiction, which it happened to be because it was a county park. Nor I was here nor there. And he asked me if I wanted to get arrested. And I was like, do you really want to do the paperwork? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and so the next thing I know, the cuffs are being put on me. So unbeknownst to me, I was thinking I was just getting tossed out of the stadium. Yeah. No. So Miller Park, if you've never been arrested there, they have their own jail down there. So they take you down to the bottom floor and their cells. And they ended up handcuffing me to a bench. And they were like, do you have anyone you want to call? I was like, can I call my lawyer? And they're just like, sure. What for? Oh yeah. So, so I called my lawyer and he was like, I was like, Hey, where are you? He's like, I'm at Miller or no, I remember what happened. I called him the first time and he didn't answer. And I, I called him, left him a pissed off voicemail and texted him. (laughs) I was like, if you don't fucking answer, I'm like, I'm going to come to your house and slap shit out of you. 
thankfully my lawyer and I have a, a pretty good working relationship. Um, so he calls me and he's like, Parker, I'm at the Brewer game with my family. He's like, what is it? It's my off day. And I was like, I'm downstairs in jail. He goes, you're what? <laughs> I was like, I'm at the park. They arrested me. Can you get me the fuck out of here? He's like, I don't know if I can get down to you. So eventually he talks to whoever gets his ass down there. And he's like, the cops knew who my lawyer was. Right. And they're like, what the hell are you doing here? He's like, he's my client. Can I take him? They're like, yes, he's drunk. He's an <laughs> asshole. Get him the fuck out of here. So on and so forth. And I was like, I was like, thank you so much. He's like, he's like, I had to leave my fucking family. Yeah. And he was so pissed at me. And I was like, yeah, but you got me out of it. I ended up having to make up for that. I took him out to dinner and I did a free DJ gig for him, but I got out of it. The other, the other fucked up Miller park story that I have is from when I stole a golf cart. So at the time, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was this, is, for that one. this is the last one. We'll, we'll get the hell out of here. So the ah, fuck, I don't know what year this was. Um, I do remember at the time uh, I got, I got cast for this pilot that Showtime was filling. They were trying to get ready to f uh, fill whatever gap Californication was leaving. And at the time, I was DJing all over the place. I, I remember met, that. I remember the short thing. Yeah. Um, I met a casting director who was like, I want you to read for this part. I'm like, I'm not I'm not an actor. He's like, no, you just have to be you, so on and so forth. Whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that story. I ended up meeting the writer and one of the producers. And the writer was co-producing it and he didn't like me at first when he saw the dailies and they had said, hang out with him. Uh, if you don't like him, we'll recast him. But we think this is the best person. And uh, he happened to be in Milwaukee and I was like, let's go to a Brewers game. I was like, you drink? I was like, if you drink, we're going to have a great time. <laughs> Brewers game, yeah. So I took him to the Brewers game and I just acted a goddamn fool. I didn't give a fuck. Like, I was like, oh, whatever. I was like, if I get fired from this, I get fired from it. I'm like, I'm going to go, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out on my flag, whatever. Yeah. So we are drunk. We are, we ended up meeting some rep. He was a sports agent rep, uh, but he worked with Gatorade. I for, I ended up calling him Cyber Bob. He used to do IT work and then he ended up in the sports field somehow. Anyway, um, we ended up hanging out with him. We were up in the, um, the skybox area. We're drinking at that, that upper bar. Yeah. Uh, we had closed down Miller Park. I'm going to repeat that again. We closed down Miller <laughs> Park. We were the last people to fucking leave. There was some NBA playoff game that was going on. We were watching it. That dude had some representation that he had to meet up with. I just remember looking over and being like, this dude's got a fucking Amex black card. I was like, I was like, is that thing fucking real? And he was like, of course it is. I was like, oh, you rich, rich. All right. <laughs> I was like, funny. I was like, we're going to a strip club after this. You should totally come with us. And he was like, hell yeah. So we ended up grabbing this dude who worked with Gatorade, was repping some like sports players, whatever. And I see this golf cart just fucking chilling. And I was like, yo, I was like, you guys know where my car is? They're like, yeah. It's like, meet you at the car. Fucking hop into this thing. And I just start driving the golf cart all over Miller Park's park uh, parking lot. And I see like some like flashing security lights <laughs> kind of off in the distance. Oh, I remember why I stole this. The Bob dude wanted to steal one of the cutouts. It was one of the players that he represented. So he wanted, oh, nice. to, he yeah. wanted to take the cutout. Sure, sure. And I was like, I'll run distraction. You get the cutout and I'll meet you guys at Silk. So I started driving around this golf cart and I just see security chasing me around. And eventually I was like, fuck, I got to get back to my car. I'm like, I don't know how to dump this thing and get rid of this guy at the same time. <laughs> ditch a golf cart. So, Tuck and roll. So I ended up, uh, I ended up just parking the, the thing right next to my car and everyone else had pulled up to my car and the security guy like is like level 10 pissed. He's like, God damn it. Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I'm going to call the cops. I was like, that's cool, man. You can call the cops. I have bail money on me, whatever. Turned around to my friends. I was like, look, I was like, here's the keys to my car. You have the keys to my apartment. I'll meet you guys there. I'll handle this. I'll get yeah. out of jail tonight, hopefully. And I'll meet you guys back at my house. In the meantime, there's beer, vodka, fridge, help yourselves, whoever's there. And uh, I ended up sitting there. I, I talked to the police department. 
was taking their sweet time with showing up. And this dude had me handcuffed. And I was just sitting on a curb. I was just shooting the shit with them. And I was telling them, like, oh, yeah, we, we met this dude. We met that dude. Yeah. Like, the guys that were with me, the one guy's a writer, blah, 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 and all this other shit. And he was just, like, looked around. He was like, you know what, man? He goes, you're not a bad dude. He's like, I think you're an idiot. But you're not a bad guy. <laughs> Takes the handcuffs off. He goes, get the fuck out of here. And I was like. Hey, man, I was like, I owe you one in the future when I run into you. I was like, hey, uh, can you call me a cab? I gave my my car to my friends. <laughs> Good for and uh, he was just like, I'm not sitting here with you. No, he's like, no. He's no, like, no, you no, have no. to get off the property. Yeah. I was like, well, how about this, man? I was like, I'll give you 50 bucks if you're driving me to my house. And he's like, where do you live? I was like, I literally live right down. I live at the end of Canal Street. Yeah. I was like, so you come out of the parking lot. I was like, you literally take Canal all the way past the the casino. I'm right behind the Harley Museum. And he's like, fine. Now, mind you, when my friends left me, they saw me in cuffs with this guy. These guys are all out in front of my apartment smoking. <laughs> show up with a guy? And I show up with this guy, <laughs> let me out, give him, a hand, give him a high five and a oh. fist bump. And he's like, Parker, nice talking with you. I was like, hey, nice talking to you too, man. Everyone's jaws are on the floor. They're like, Point America. They're like, that guy arrested you. I go, yeah, and he dropped me off too. Yeah. I was like, it's was, it was great. I was like, hey, anyone get a hold of Bob? They're like, yeah, he's at the strip club. I was like, let's go meet up with yeah. Bob. Sorry, Bob. I was like, I believe Bob owes his drinks for me running interference so he could steal that cutout of one of his athletes. Fair point. And we'll end it on that story. Dope. Um, Nick, thank you for coming on. Yeah, man. Uh, this was a blast. Um, shout out to Randon, the producer. Randon, who is now officially a full-time employee at WISSN or oh. WISN. Nice, man. Woo! Yes, that's awesome. Making that big money now. You can pay me back for all that babysitting I did when, I, <laughs> when you were a kid. Um, what else? Check us out on Spotify. Uh, Zero Cool Podcast. Also on Apple uh, iTunes. Uh, you can find us also on YouTube if you're watching this. Uh, well, obviously, it's on YouTube and shit like that. <laughs> uh, don't forget Shadow Personal Fitness 2518. Uh, Shadow Personal Training. Shadow in- Personal Instagram, training. all one word. Uh, 2618 North Halstead. It's in Lincoln Park in Chicago. Uh, I only have Instagram right now. And then I'm um, personal page is Chicago Nick 1878. Those that ask, that is the year that United was founded as Newton Heath Railway FC. And then my dog's uh, Instagram is Shadow the Super Dogs. Dog spelled D-A-W-G in... Reference to Superdog Hot Dog Stand in Chicago, Illinois on Devon. So, yeah, <laughs> like, follow, share. Once again, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are going to be off next week due to, the fa- due to Father's Day. So, Randy and I are going to spend some time with our dads. And then uh, we'll be back the following week with a uh, fo- co-founder of the Chicago Fire yeah. and uh, many other teams. Uh, Peter Wilt will be in the house. I'm excited to sit down and talk with him. Uh, this might be the first time I ever talked to him sober. So, <laughs> this Yeah, will be probably, honestly. Um, at least one of you. Yeah, at least one of us. Uh, but that that probably won't stay too long. Um, once again, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Uh, love you. Take care. Be safe. Mahalo. Sorry I killed the air during the <laughs>